In the trial, both defendants are in court with their attorneys and the people are represented. And we have both juries in the uh, courtroom at this point uh, to the Loudon and Mendez jury. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, uh, but uh, we haven't finished off the testimony from this morning, uh, but we now have, and we're ready to resume. The next witness will be testifying uh, before both juries, um, and uh, you may call your next witness. The people call Donovan Goodrow to the stand. Donovan Goodrow, G O O D R E A U. Mr. Goodrow, sit back and take a deep breath, okay? okay? Back in February of 1989, were you living in Princeton, New Jersey? Yes, I was. And in February of that year, did you uh, meet Lyle Menendez? Yes, I did. Do you see Lyle Menendez in court today? Yes, I do. What, what color um, clothing is he wearing today that you can see? Beige. Does he have Beige a sweater with a blue um, collar. Okay, indicating the defendant for the record, please, Your Honor. Yes. Okay. That's the defendant, Lyle Menendez. Were you working at the time that you first met Lyle Menendez? Uh, yes, I was. And where were you working? I was working at uh, TGI Fridays in the Princeton Market Fair. And how did you meet Lyle Menendez? Uh, through his girlfriend, Jamie Pizarna. Is that Pizarre sick? Yes, excuse me. Did she also work at TGI Fridays with you? Yes, she did. And it was through her that you met Mr. Menendez? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And uh, was he a student at Princeton University when you met him? Yes, he was. And I take it this TGI Fridays was in the same area that the university was? Yes, it was at the Princeton Market Fair. It was a short distance from the school. Were you a student at Princeton University at the time that you met Lyle Menendez? No, I wasn't. Were you ever a student at Princeton University? No, I wasn't. And when you met Lyle Menendez, did you and he become friends? Yes, we did. And after becoming friends, did you, in fact, uh, become his roommate? Yes, I did. And when you were his roommate, where did you live with him? On uh, Gauss Hall on campus. OK, is Gauss spelled G-A-U-S-C? G-A-U-S-S, I think. Okay. And that was student housing for Princeton University, is that correct? Yes, it was. So even though you were a non-student, you were living in the student housing, is that correct? Yes. How long did you actually live in this room at Gauss Hall with uh, Lyle Menendez? Approximately two months. And at the end of two months, did you leave the room? Yes, I did. And under, briefly, under what circumstances did you leave? Um, it was towards the end of the school year for him. And uh, he was under the assumption that I was a Princeton student. And uh, I think uh, he had found out that I wasn't going to be a matriculating student, being, um, becoming a student the next year. And was kind of under the understanding that I was. And it upset him, so he wanted me out of the room. So did you, in fact, leave? Yes, I did. And when you left the room, uh, did you notice after you left that you left something behind? Yes, I did. Okay. Now, when you left um, Princeton, where did you go? I went to New York. And why did you pick New York? Um, I have family. And when you went there, did you take a bus, a plane, a train, a car? How did you do it? I had a truck. I just drove. Uh, sometime while driving to New York, did you discover that something was missing? Uh, yes, I did. I pulled over on uh, Route 1 um, because I was assuming that I might be pulled over. And I didn't have my wallet with me. So I looked through all the stuff that we had put in the back upon my moving out, and uh, I didn't find my wallet. Now, when you say we had put in the back, did someone help you pack your bags and leave? Yes. And who was that? Um, Glenn Stevens, Lyle Menendez, um, Hayden. OK, is that Hayden Rogers? Yes. Was uh, Hayden Rogers a friend of Lyle's at the university? Yes, he was. Uh, was Glenn Stevens a friend of Lyle's at the university? Yes, he was. And as long as we're going down the list, I believe you indicated you knew Ms. Pizarsik, um, Lyle Menendez's girlfriend. Was she a Princeton University student? Uh, no, she wasn't. Now, I think you indicated you thought you might get pulled over. Was there something wrong with your truck? Um, yeah. I, uh, the registration wasn't complete. Um, I didn't have, like, the smog stuff done on it. It wasn't, it wasn't complete registration. It was a lot of paperwork. And if had anyone pulled them over, they may have given them a ticket. 
Given, so. given them a ticket? Or given, given, well, whoever is driving the truck. All right. And did you notice your wallet was missing? Yeah, upon leaving the school, yes, I did. Did you ever get that wallet back? No, I didn't. What was inside of the wallet when you last saw it? Oh, uh, driver's license, California, um, social security card, couple pictures, phone numbers, bank card. Okay, do you remember what kind of bank card you had? Uh, Wells Fargo. And is that the kind of bank card where you put it in an ATM machine, you punch in a number, and then you get money? Yes, it is. OK. Did you have any credit cards in there? Uh, no, I didn't. And uh, the items that you've just identified to us, it was a wallet and the contents. Did you ever get any of those items back? Uh, no, I didn't. Now, I believe you indicated you had a California driver's license. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And was that the driver's license you were using when you were um, driving in New Jersey? Yes, it, yes, it was. And at one point prior to living in New Jersey, had you, in fact, lived in California? Yes. Do you remember what city that you lived in? Um, several. Cupertino, Sunnyvale, San Jose. Your Honor, I have here um, a certified copy from the DMV of a driver's license. I'd like to mark this as people's. I believe we're at 49. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I have here a copy of, of from the DMV. I also have two Xerox copies of the certification and the license itself. Um, may these be the subsets 49 A and B for duplicates? All right. You can mark them separately. <coughs> uh, 15, 51, then? No, you can mark them 49 and B, just mark okay. my California driver's license. Was this the one that was inside of your wallet when you left Princeton University? Uh, what month was it when you left? Uh, early May. Now, um, on this particular copy, it's kind we of... We have an answer to the previous question. You asked something about what's this in your wallet. Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, this item number 49, which I now have up on the board <coughs> of both juries, um, is this a copy of the driver's license that was inside of your wallet uh, when you left it behind at Princeton? Yes, it is. Now, on the right side, it's hard to see, but it, there appears to be a, a number, a, a typical California driver's license number. Could you read that number to the jury? C5374791. And was that, in fact, your dri California driver's license number? I have no idea. All right. Well, did you ever, like, use your driver's license to cash a check or anything like that? Um, uh, did I ever use it to cash a check? You know, when they ask sure. you... Sure. I'm sure I have, yes. All right. And they ask you what your license number is? No, I don't remember. I don't recall ever having to use my license number. Okay. But this particular driver's license, 49, is this, in fact, a true and correct copy of the license that was in your wallet? Yes, it is. Now, the address on this driver's license appears to be 10646 Rosewood Road, Apartment A, Cupertino, California, 95014. Was that your address at the time that you got this license? Yes. Can you speak up? Yes, it is. Okay. After you left, after you left the room in approximately, I think it was May of 1989, um, when was the next time you saw Lyle Menendez? I never did. Now. T today is the first time since then? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, sometime um, in August of 1989, did you become aware of the killings of Jose and uh, Mary Louise Menendez? Yes, I did. And sometime after that, were you contacted by the Beverly Hills Police Department? Uh, yes, I was. And uh, prior to them contacting you, had you made an attempt through the Beverly Hills Police Department to find out what had happened? Yes, I did. And um, after that, when the police contacted you, did they ask you about your whereabouts on a particular day in August of 1989? In March of 1990, they asked for my whereabouts um, on the date of August 18th, 1989. And were you able, in uh, March of 1990, to reconstruct your whereabouts on the day of August the 18th of 1989? Yes. Okay. Where were you on that day? I was in New York City, working. And where were you working? Boxer's restaurant. 
uh, will you by any chance in San Diego uh, at any time either two days before or two days after the 18th of August of 1989? No. Okay. Did you buy any shotguns during that period of time? I'm talking about that five-day period. No, I didn't. Okay. Your Honor, I have here um, some records, some uh, work records. I'd like to mark them um, as people's next in order, which is 50. Um, actually, what it is is an envelope containing two pieces of paper, one of which looks like a time card, the other of which is just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. May the envelope and its contents be marked as 50, please? Yes. Thank you. May I approach, please? Yes. Mr. Goudreau, first of all, I'm going to show you what looks like a standard time card. I'd like to ask you, um, what does this represent? This is my time card for the, uh, for boxers, just during the week. Okay, and at the request of the Beverly Hills Police Department, did you in fact get the time card for the, for the week in question that is uh, on or about the 18th of August of 1989? Yes, I did. In addition, this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, which appears to be, uh, is this an original? Yes, it is. Okay, and it has a number of names on the left of it. It also has the name Donovan. It has Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all the way through Wednesday listed at the top. And it appears on Friday, um, there are numbers there that say 8 slash 6. Could you indicate for your name on Friday what 8 slash 6 means? I was working the morning shift, 8 to 6 p.m. And next to it for Saturday is the word um, uh, put in a pen, host. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And did you then, in fact, work as the host at the restaurant on Saturday? Saturday evening, yes, I did. So that would have been the 19th of August. Is that correct? Yes. And then on Sunday, it looks like it says off. Is that correct? Yes. And then on Monday, it says 8 slash 6. Would that mean that you were off on Sunday, uh, the 20th, and back at work on the 21st? Yes. <coughs> Your Honor, I also have um, four Exhibit 50. I have Xeroxes of both of the documents contained therein. I shall mark those also as 50 these are what? They're Xeroxes of the contents of People's 50, the two pages, the time These card and the record. Okay. These are duplicates then of uh, Exhibit 50. Yes, they're actually just Xeroxes, Your Honor. Yeah. In addition to providing um, records of your whereabouts, uh, around the 18th of August of 1989, did you also provide a handwriting sample um, for use in a handwriting comparison? Yes. Okay, Your Honor, I have here an envelope. I'd like to have it and its contents marks as P uh, Exhibit 51, please. Yes. Can I approach, please? Yes. Showing you Exhibit 51, which is an envelope addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department containing two pieces of 8.5 by 11, looks like graph paper, I'd like to ask you if these two pieces of paper are familiar to you. Yes, they are. Okay, and um, what is this? <laughs> That's my signature. All right, it's not a, a reading for your heartbeat or anything? That's your signature? Yes. Okay. And lastly, Your Honor, I have here an envelope. I'd like to mark it and its contents, which contain three pieces of paper as Exhibit 52, please, Your Honor. 52. In addition, I have placed on both boards a blow-up of all of the pieces of paper uh, for Exhibit 52. Maybe these be marked as 52. They'll be marked as uh, 53. <coughs> 53. Both of them? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. And Goudreau. What we can do is mark 52, if there are separate documents there, A, B, and C. All right, thank you. And then the same 53, A, B, and C, corresponding documents. Actually, on 53, there are four pages because it's a back and front of one page. Okay. So I'll start slowly from the beginning. All right. Mr. Goudreau, I have here an exhibit which is contained in 52. It is a yellow piece of paper. The original is yellow. We're going to call this 52A for the record and the reverse side will be 52B. I'd like to ask you if you ever filled out this form or had anything to do with the transaction contained in this form, 52A. No. 
Now, um, you can see there there's a signature that appears to be something to, along the lines of Donovan Goudreau and the date 8-1889. Do you see that? Yes. And for the jury, uh, the first page of 53 corresponds to the testimony that he's giving right now. Um, and for the other jury, that would be the top page um, with the driver's license. Then, Mr. Goudreau, in the middle of the page, you can see the signature and also the date. Is that correct? Um, yes. And you did not, in fact, sign that form at any time, did you, sir? No, I didn't. Now, um, also, while you're looking at the form, can you see that it has type of identification CDL C5374791? Do you yes. see that there? Yes, I do. All right, does that correspond to the license? Uh, California license number on the license that I just showed you. Yes, it does. Rather than you going back and forth, if Mr. Kuriyama could volunteer his services to move some of these uh, pages. All right. Um, Your Honor, we can skip over the next page. Uh, and all right, the next page on this exhibit. two-thirds down the page to contain a signature under 8, 18, 89, and the 8 from 18 is written over, and there's a signature, John, Jonathan Goudreau, and I'm showing you exhibit what we're going to call 52C, excuse me, 50, 52B. I'd like to ask you, right here, referring to 81889, dealer register number 415, signature Donovan Goudreau, 63 August Street. Did you fill out that form, sir? No. And lastly, referring to the uh, last portion of 52, which is 52C. Uh, just below um, the middle of the page, there's another notation of 81889. Dealer 415, signature Donovan Goudreau, 63 August Street. Did you fill that out, sir? No. And for this jury, I'll show it. August Street, which is listed on these last two forms we've talked about, 52 B and C. Do you know what 63 August Street is? No, I don't. Did you ever live at 63 August Street? No. Now, your last name is spelled um, G O O D R E A U, is that correct? Yes. We have a moment, please, Your Honor. Now, I think you made reference to the fact that inside of the wallet um, that you did not have with you when you went to New York was a bank card. Is that correct? Yes. After you noticed your bank card missing, did you ever notice any withdrawals on that account using the ATM bank card? No. During the period of time that you uh, were living with Lau Menendez, how would you characterize your relationship with him? Uh, he was my best friend. And that was for a period of two months, is that correct? Probably three and a half months, maybe. At some point during this three and a half month period, uh, did you go to California with him? Yes, I did. Could you tell us the circumstances of how, did, how that occurred? Um, he had gone out over spring break. I stayed in Princeton, and the next day he called me up and sent me a ticket to come out and see him. And did you, in fact, use that ticket to go see him? Yes, I did. Did you pay for that ticket? No, I didn't. 
And do you met, did you ever meet the Menendez family while you were in California? Yes, I did. For what period of time did you know them? Um, I met them originally in California, and then when his father came out to Princeton, I met him twice. Okay, did you meet the father at Princeton before or after? After. Okay, so you met the family together in California, and then later on the father at Princeton, is that correct? Yes. Okay. When uh, you went to the family home, was Eric Menendez there? Yes, he was. Okay, did you have um, dinner at the family home? Yes. And uh, how many days did you spend with the entire family? In California? Yes. <coughs> One. How many days did you spend in California total? Maybe four. And um, was it the first night you, that you were there that the whole family was there? Yes. Did you have dinner with the family? Yes. Okay. Could you tell us what the dinner was like? <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was a lot of pressure. He hadn't seen his father in a while. Okay. Now, are you a little nervous? Isn't everybody here nervous? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, take, take a breath. When you say he hadn't seen his father in a while, who are you referring to? Um, referring to Lau. We had gone out there. I had never met his father. He told me, his fa told me a lot about his father. And, and going out for dinner, we were kind of talking about some of the things we were going to talk about during dinner. And, okay, when you ta yeah. say you talked about some of the things you were going to talk about during dinner, were you talking about topics or? Yes. All right, and during the dinner, uh, what was the atmosphere like? I was sitting on pins and needles, but uh, okay. Lyle seemed to handle it pretty well. All right, but you were sitting on pins and needles. Why? Well, because I was, Lyle was also, at the time, still under the assumption that I was going to become a Princeton student. And his father turned to me after greeting me and started asking me questions about that. Now, let's talk about this idea of you being a Princeton student. How did that idea get started? It started when I got a job at TGI Fridays. And uh, who mentioned the idea that you were going to Princeton? Uh, to get a job there, I told him I was going to be in the area that I was planning on being a student at school. And then Jamie heard about it, and then Jamie told Lyle, and, and, and then just grew and grew and grew. And pretty soon you, everyone thought you were going to be graduating from Princeton University. Yes. Did you have any intention of graduating from Princeton No, University? I didn't. Had you ever applied to Princeton? No, I haven't. Okay. But so the genesis or the beginning of this was that you were trying to get this job? Yes. Now, um, when you had this dinner with the Menendez family on your first night in California, um, did Mr. Menendez ask you questions about your plans? Yes, he did, right away. Um, did you tell him that you were going to be a Princeton student? Uh, yes. Were you convincing? Not very. Okay. Um, were you uncomfortable during the dinner? Um, initially, yes, but after a while, he turned to Lyle and they started conversing about school and other things. and pressure was kind of off at that point. What about the mother? What was she like? When? When you had dinner. She was very quiet. Did you, did you speak to her at all? Um, not directly, no. Did anyone speak to her? N not directly, no. What was she doing? She was sitting uh, there and listening very intently to what was going on. And, and then as she would sit, try to include herself in part of this conversation. No one really paid much attention to her. Now, who was present at this dinner? Would you give us all the participants? Um, Lyle's mother and father. Lyle, myself. Okay, was Eric at the dinner table? No, he wasn't. Do you know where he was? Um, I'm assuming he was out. I remember seeing him earlier. All right, so you had seen him earlier in the day? Yes. And do you see him in court today? Yes, I do. What's he wearing today? He's wearing a plaid red shirt, with blue tie. Referring to the defendant, Eric Menendez, of counsel table. Thank you. Now, after this um, dinner that you had with the Menendez family, the did you spend the night at the Menendez home? Yes, I did. And the following day, did you see the parents? I can't recall if I did in the morning or not. You don't. Nothing stands out in your mind. No. Okay. Uh, where did you stay inside of the house? Uh, one of the upstairs bedrooms. Okay. Do you know where Lyle stayed when um, you spent that first night there? Um, I'm assuming in the guest house. Okay. Out well, in the back. Right, so there was a guest house on the property? Yes, it was. And during the period of time that you were in California, did you ever go and look around the guest house? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Could you tell us what it was like? It was a, uh, it looked like its own house out and back. It was a nice little place, the kitchen downstairs. Upstairs was a, a bedroom and a bathroom. It was very well kept. It was uh, just off the side of the tennis courts. OK, so you actually went inside of it? Yes, I did. Now, um, this trip that you went on, was this during spring break? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it was. It wasn't your spring break, but it was everybody else's who was in school, right? Yes. Okay. 
And then after, the day after the dinner, um, did the parents leave to go someplace? Um, I was under the assumption that uh, Eric had a tennis tournament in Florida. And uh, I was just lying myself by ourselves over the weekend. And so you stayed in the Menendez home during the weekend? Is yes, I right? did. And then the next time you saw anyone in the Menendez family would have been the father, is that correct? Yes. And did he visit Lyle at Princeton University while you were still Lyle's roommate? Yes. So that would have been before you got uh, escorted out of the room? Yes. Okay. Now, when you uh, were preparing yourself for this dinner, um, was there any anxiety in Lyle Menendez? In other words, did he give you any tips or give you any clues to what kind of dinner you were going to have? Yes, he did. Okay, could you tell us about that, please? Uh, I think either that afternoon or shortly before that, he had told me that uh, his father was very critical of his friends and that he was really hoping that uh, his father would like me. Now, um, the summer of 1989, were you, did you have some plans to go and spend the summer in California with the Menendez family? Yes. And did you, in fact, ever do that? No, I didn't. Um, were you ever told why you couldn't do that? Well, when I left the room, it was pretty much, you know, given that I wasn't going to go out for the summer. And when you say you left the room, what room are you talking about? Um, the room, the dorm room at Gauss Hall. In, on Princeton. All right. Um, this is out of context, but where were you born? California. Glenora. In Glendora? Glenora. Oh, Glenora, California. Okay. And how old are you now, sir? 26. Okay. May I have a moment, please, Your Honor? Yes. You can move back if you want. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever give permission to um, Eric Hernandez to use your driver's license? No. And during the period of time that you and Lyle Hernandez were roommates, did you ever allow him to use your license? Yes, I did. And did, did um, you ever use his? Um, I used his uh, student ID to eat on campus, a social security card, just to memorize the numbers. Okay. Was the social security number required in order to get into a place to eat at Princeton University? Yes, it was. And so you were allowed to eat there even though you weren't a student, is that correct? Well, you weren't allowed to, you just... Exactly. Okay. Thank you, nothing further. Cross-examination, who wants to go first? All right, Ms. Lansing. Mr. Goudreau, you told us that you first met Lyle Menendez in 1989, in February, is that correct? Yes. And you met him through his girlfriend, Jamie, is that correct? Yes. From the time you met him to the day that you left his dorm room, did you see him on a regular basis? Yes. How often did you see him? Every day. Were you with him all day? Pretty much all day. Were the two of you the closest of the friends of the group of people who were around? Uh, yes, until the end, shortly before the end, uh, started to change a little. Okay. And the other two um, people who were around most frequently were Hayden Rogers and Glenn Stevens at that time? Yes. You had I'm, uh, I'm apprehensive because Greg Guest was also around. Okay. And you were not going to classes with him? Obviously, because you weren't a student, is that correct? I still went to a couple classes. Okay. And I sat in on some lectures and stuff. What other things would you do together? Everything. I mean, all day long. Um, I was working at in the evenings at TJ Fridays, but outside of that, I spent we spent all our time together. We ate together. Did everything together. Did you talk a lot? Yes, we did. And did you talk about your families a lot? Yes, we did. 
and did you think that you and Lyle were on the same footing in terms of economics? No. No, not at all. What was the difference? He came from a wealthy family and I didn't. Okay. And how did you know he came from a wealthy family? Um, he told me. Actually, and I think Jamie told me first. Okay. And uh, did you see him spending money? <laughs> yes, I did. What kinds of things would he buy? Well, he wasn't extravagant. I mean, he wasn't any more wealthy than any of the other kids at, at Princeton. School. Yeah, we, he didn't have all the money in the world. I mean, he was basically an allowance like I, most students there. So he was, you know, he had, he spent, you know, accordingly. Did he have credit cards? Uh, I think he had one credit card, yes. And could he sign for things at the student store? Yes, he could. And what types of things could he buy, or did you see him buy? At, at the, the student store? At the university store. Well, we got a, I think the most expensive would have been a computer, which his father approved of, and uh, clothes much? and other things. How much was the computer? I'm assuming a little over 3000 And who was the computer for? Did he use a computer? Actually, it became more, he used a computer, but I think, other, I think a couple other people came and used it, too. And did you use it? Yes, I did. So he could just sign at the, at the university store for the... For just about anything, and a bill went to his father. Okay. And you said he bought the computer, and he bought clothes? Clothes, yes. Now, did he buy, like, one sweatshirt during the time, or Oh, more? no, I mean, a lot of clothes. I mean, sweatshirts and shorts and sweats and all kinds of stuff. Okay. And did he buy food there? Could you buy food there? No. Was there a place you could order pizzas from? Yes, it was on campus. Okay. And did he uh, order pizzas and charge them? I don't recall any, no. Did other people uh, borrow things that belonged to Lyle? Yeah, Lyle was pretty lax about that. Things His like dorm room was always open, except for maybe, you know, every once in a while he would lock the door. And people would come in and borrow shoes, and there were several occasions where people would come by and and borrow a shirt here and there and then return it later, or CDs. Hayden was very, if we were missing anything, we'd just go over to Hayden's room. And find it. Okay. So Lyle's door was open and people helped themselves, yeah. I take it. And he didn't seem to stop that. No, I, he, everyone was under the assumption that uh, uh, it was okay as long as you told him about it. And if he wasn't there, then they returned it. Great guess he brought a pair of shoes one time and he allowed them to bite his head off. It wasn't. There wasn't any problems with that. Was he generous with his friends? Um, with his close circle of friends, yes, very generous. In what ways? Well, he, again, he didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, he had what little allowance he had and whatever. He spent that very quickly. But if he had $10 and we were hungry, we would all eat. So. And while you were uh, at Princeton, was he helping you out economically while you were living in the dorm room with him? Well, uh, aside from living in dorm, which was the greatest um, help of all, um, I have to say, I want to say no, but there was a couple times he did help me, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think you've already mentioned that you would use the card that he had to eat? Yes. So I take it that the dorm included The dorm meals. and his uh, school pass for food. Okay. Now, Did he talk to you about whether he was happy being at Princeton or not? Yes, he did. And what did he tell you about that? Um, I don't think he enjoyed being there. Whose idea was Princeton? Um, it was his father's idea to go to Princeton. And when he talked to you about his family, did he tell you how he felt about that, the fact that uh, he was going to the school that his father had picked? Yeah, did I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. When he talked to you about the fact that he was attending Princeton because his father had picked that school, did he tell you how he felt about it? Was he angry or disappointed, or what was his feeling about that? Um, I think he was happy to go there. It was a great school, but it, he was kind of under, um, pressure to do well, on, and uh, this was all kind of a residual effect from his father. Did he ever indicate to you that he wanted to go to any other school? Other yes, than, he did. Where did he want to go to school? Um, UCLA, I think, came to mind. Okay. 
And when you spent all this time with him um, and you were talking, would you just stay in the dorm room or would you go places with him? Oh, uh, well, we traveled everywhere together. We just never stopped talking. I mean, in my truck, in his Volkswagen, everywhere, over dinner. Did you spend time with him at his Aunt Terry's house? Yes, several nights. And would he go over there regularly to visit? Yeah, it was a very comfortable place to go stop on. And on the two occasions that you've told us that you saw his father back there, was it at Aunt Terry's or was it somewhere else? Um, I'm sorry. How many times did you see Mr. Menendez back in Princeton? Three. Oh, in Princeton twice. Okay. And where, what, where was it? At Aunt Terry's house. Okay. <laughs> and on uh, those occasions, did you see Lyle and his father interact? Yes. What was the nature of the relationship? Um, it was uh, it was just a basic father and son relationship. It didn't seem he wasn't his father was in town on business. He had a lot of things on his mind. Lyle brought the computer over into his aunt Terry's house to show him, and uh, I think we were learning how to use a computer at the time. We're still good adjusting to it, so it was over dinner. It was quite you know informal. Do you remember an incident where? He took Lyle down into the basement for an extended talk at yes. Aunt Terry's. Yes, I did. How long was that talk? Three hours. Did anybody else go down there during that period of time? I don't know. Were you there the whole time? Um, the whole conversation? I can't remember if I was there the whole conversation. <laughs> were you there for a long time? Yes. Did anybody go into the basement during the time you were there? I didn't see anyone go downstairs, no. Okay. And would his father uh, call him on the phone, or would he call his parents in front of you on a regular basis during this time that you knew him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. How often? I'd say no more than once a week. That Who would call whom? Well, Lyle would call home, or his father would call. I'd say it goes both ways. Okay. And were you aware of the type of information that his father wanted from him? Did you just call to say, hi, how are you, or? More like checkup calls. What, what do you mean by checkup calls? How is this going? I'm talking about the nature of the calls. Thank you. Um, you know, if Lau had a test coming up or Lau wasn't doing well in school, he was always kind of just calling to find out how he was getting along and things. Now, when you knew that you were going to come out to California and meet Mr. Menendez, um, you told us that you were nervous because you knew that you had represented yourself as a Princeton student, and that wasn't true. Yes. Is that correct? Um, why were you particularly nervous about meeting Mr. Menendez under those conditions? Um, Lala told me uh, about a former friend of his named Cole, who his father, I think, liked Cole, but didn't think that he was going to accomplish much, and kind of thought that he would be a very good influence for Lala. Did you have the sense that Mr. Menendez picked Lyle's friends and girlfriends? Um, maybe not necessarily picked, but had a really strong influence in choosing them. Okay. And did you uh, practice for this dinner table conversation? Yes, we did. How did you practice? Well, he would play the part of his father. He being Lyle? Yeah. And you would be you? I would be me. And how often did you practice? before this dinner table conversation. I can't recall how long we did it, but it seemed like maybe a little more than an hour. And when Lyle was playing Mr. Menendez, what type of, what was the questioning like? Oh, just background stuff and, you know, what I want to do, what I want to accomplish for the future and stuff. Nothing more than that. And uh, after you had this hour practice session to meet Mr. Menendez, was the actual meeting similar to the way uh, the practice session had been? <laughs> yes, it was. In what ways? Um, the questions weren't exactly the same, but uh, I was I felt as equally under pressure with Lyle as I was with his father, having to say the same ridiculous answers over and over again, being false. Okay. But in trying to recreate what you would experience with his father, he made it a very intense experience, is that correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. And the, and the actual dinner conversation with Mr. Menendez was, in fact, intense? Yes, it was. Okay. <coughs> 
Mr. Goudreau, can you see from where you are the book that I'm holding up? Yes. The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino? Yes. Do you recognize this book? Um, yes, I do. How is it you recognize it? Um, Lyle gave me a copy of that book when I was living with him. And what did he tell you about this book? It was uh, just an inspirational author that he had kind of fallen in love with over the years. Who had directed him to this book? His father. And how would his father deal with him with this book? Oh, I don't know. Did Lyle seem to be able to quote sections, passages of this book? Yes, quite and, readily. And did you learn to memorize sections of this book also? Yes, I did. Is that part of the relationship that you had with Lyle, was that he was training you to a degree the same way his father trained him? No. What was the purpose of memorizing sections of the book? Well, he just liked the author and thought the book was very, uh, I don't know, just, just very well. Uh, it, was, it was a type of book where it kind of told you, broke things down to scriptures. And it wasn't like very religious, but it just kind of said, you know, it was just an inspirational author that he thought I would like and, and read often. So he re actually read me the first, um, first couple scriptures. And could he quote them? Yes, he could. And by the end of the relationship, could you quote them? Uh, within a couple weeks, I could have quoted them. Did uh, Jose strike you as a very powerful man? Yes. An intimidating man? Um, no, not, he didn't, I wasn't intimidated by him, but I, I could see in a business sense he was very intimidating. Okay. Did it seem to be important to Lyle to please him? Yes, it was. Did Lyle ever discuss with you the possibility that he was already out of his father's will? I can't recall, no. Might have come up? I think it may have come up. I don't remember. Did he have a sense that maybe he wasn't doing everything that his father wanted? Yes. Did he have a sense that he was disappointing his father? Yes. Did he seem to want to do what would make his father happy? When you were asked to leave the dorm room, who asked you to leave? Lyle did. Can you tell me how that happened? On uh, early May, 7th, 8th, or 9th, uh, I had woken up. He was gone. He came in to the room, and behind him was um, great guest Hayden Rogers and Glenn Stevens. Lyle told the, f the three of them that he was going to do the talking, and he sat me down and told me that he found out that I wasn't going to be a Princeton student, and he was feels like he was let down in the friendship, and asked me to leave. Did he seem sad? Yes, he did. And were there other things that were discussed? Other things that that he had some questions about whether you'd been honest with him or not? Yes, he did. And did he question whether you'd been honest with him about your feelings and whether the friendship was genuine? Yes, he did. Did he seem to be hurt? Oh yes, very much. Did he receive a call that morning from his parents that you know of? Objection calls for speculation here, sir. Sustained. Just whether, not what the conversation was, just whether he'd received a call that morning, Your Honor. Are you asking whether this witness received a phone call? No, I'm asking if this witness knows if Lyle had received a call from his parents well, that morning. Well, we call for conclusion on his part unless he was there. Were you there? Uh, I did answer the phone. His father did call. That morning? Yes. Did you have any conversation with his father yourself? He asked where Lyle was, and I said, he's not here right now. Do you want to have him call you back? And he said, no, I'll call back. Now, when Lyle confronted you about the fact that you had misrepresented yourself in several areas, um, did he tell you then you had to leave? Yes. Was this a very emotional scene? Oh, yeah, very much so. Can you tell me how? Um, it was just tough. There was no preparation time for me to sit there and tell them why or how this had all gotten started. Hayden was very upset, was very protective of Lyle, and wanted to like hurt me. But, like everyone was holding him back, and uh, I never really got a chance to set the record straight with that. So, 
started. Set the record straight in what way? How things had gotten started, where I was really coming from. Why you had told the lies? Yes. And was that sad for you also? Oh, yeah. It was really hurt. I, was, I had a great friendship with all of them. Under false pretenses, but yet yeah, still a great friendship. And when Lyle uh, told you you had to leave, did he seem more angry or more hurt? Very hurt. And how did your possessions end up leaving that room? Um, I kept most of my things in like a milk crate. I had like several milk crates like most college students do. And uh, we pulled the truck up to the window. Who we pulled the truck up? Lyle and Greg Guest went and got the truck, which was parked over by one of the eating clubs where we had left it the night before. Drove it back over. We loaded the stuff in, out the window just right onto the truck. When you say loaded the stuff out the window, was this done gently and in an organized oh, yeah. fashion? No, it, it took some time. This whole episode lasted about maybe a little more than an hour. I got up and after he had spoken to me, I took a shower and came back to the room. We started putting stuff together and there was some conflict over whether I was going to be taking some of his stuff or not. And, you know, we were kind of going through it and separating ownership of things. Okay. And you were putting it, things in the truck yourself? Um, I think I helped a little bit towards the end, but a lot of the, the moving was done by um, somebody else. It wasn't me. Who else was doing it? Um, maybe Greg Guest and uh, Hayden, I think, were doing a lot of it. I'm not sure where Lyle was at this time. Did you see him as you drove off? Yes, I did. And how did he look? Um, that was the last time I remember him. He was standing about 100 yards of hand in his pocket, head down. Excuse me, 100 yards? 100 yards away. And I was just about to drive off. And I looked out the side window. And uh, the roads were perpendicular. And I was about to head off. And I looked down the driveway. And I could see him standing there facing me. And uh, I just drove off. How did he look? Well, from that distance, he, he looked upset in the room. Um, but you could see at that moment he was like, he, his head was down and his hands were in his pocket. He looked pretty upset. Upset angry or upset sad? Um, probably both. Did he say anything to, more to you while he was packing your things up? No. When you spent all of this time with Lyle and talked about your past and your future, I, I take it you covered both? Yes. And did you talk about what both of you had in terms of dreams for the future, business plans, family plans, hopes for the future? Yes. And did you feel that the two of you had similar dreams? Yes, we did. And when you talked about your past, did you feel that you had similarities in your past also? Yes, we did. And what kind of similarities did you have in your past? Very oppressive fathers. And when he talked about his father's behavior toward him, did he tell you anything specific about what his father did? Your Honor, I don't know how being her son. Sister. Your Honor, I think there's been a lot of testimony. Well, Counselor, okay, I'm sorry. I want to argue with you from your side okay. When you say it was, that it was very oppressive, did he complain about his father? Yes, he did. And did he seem to feel that the things his father had done were wrong? Uh, calls for hearsay and speculation of the witness. Objection overall. Yes. And did he point to particular things his father had done that seemed to be wrong? Yes. And what did he point to? When you talked about your background, did you talk about areas that you had in common? Yes. And was it your impression that Lyle admired his father? Yes, very much so. And yet, were there things about him that he did not admire? Yes. Mr. Goudreau, 
uh, you spoke about a computer. Do you remember what kind of computer it was? Was it, and what I'm talking about, was it an Apple or was it an IBM or IBM clone? It's an Apple. Okay. Do you remember, was it um, a desk computer or was it a portable computer? It was a personal computer. By personal computer, you mean? It was not a portable. Okay, it wasn't a notebook? No. Okay. And you worked on that computer as well? Yes, I did. Did you ever see Lyle Menendez working on the computer? Yes, I did. Do you appear to know how to work it? No. No? <laughs> he couldn't work an Apple computer? Uh, no, he couldn't. Okay. Now, um, I believe you indicated that um, you and Lyle were extremely close friends, correct? Yes. And that you were very hurt by the fact that you were um, ejected from his room. Would that be correct? Not necessarily from the room, but from the relationship, yes. Okay. Um, and you were very hurt, correct? Yes. And he was very hurt? I'm assuming so, yes. Well, you testified he looked hurt. He looked hurt. Okay. Um, after you discovered that his um, parents were deceased, did he ever make any attempt to get in touch with you? Um, two weeks ago, I received a letter. All right, but aside from the two weeks ago, between um, May of 1989 and two weeks ago, did he ever make any attempt to get in touch with you? No. And you were very good friends, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right, anything further on those matters before we take a break? Okay. Um, what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, is excuse the Eric Menendez jury until tomorrow at 1030. And we'll continue on a little bit here with the Lyle Menendez jury. So uh, when you come back tomorrow at 1030, I'd ask that instead of coming in here, that you take the road that the other jury has been traveling and go next door to uh, Department uh, O. <laughs> and uh, use their jury room, walk into the jury room there, and uh, as soon as we're ready for you, we'll call you in to this courtroom, and then you'll take the seats in the uh, center section of the uh, courtroom um, during the time both juries are present. So um, at this point, then, um, I, I assume you might have some stuff inside the jury room, some of you. If you do, you can collect that material, and we'll excuse you until 10.30 tomorrow morning. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any opinions about it. We'll see you back in Department O at 10.30 tomorrow morning. This only relates to the defendant, Lyle Menendez, here. May I have a question from Harry Rogers? Certainly. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mr. DeBro, uh, Maybe, uh, is that mic on so we can hear you? No, it's not on. It's Just, on. yeah. Uh, Mr. Bordeaux, I believe you indicated that you and Lyle were very close and that he was very generous. Um, but I think you also indicated in your other testimony that he didn't seem to have a lot of cash. Is that correct? Yes. Now, the student store at Princeton University, could you tell me what kind of items it sold? It sold generally uh, everything you would need for classrooms, notebooks and books. And they had a, a bookstore, but upstairs was a clothing store you could purchase anything with the Princeton logo on it. All right, so that would be sweatshirts? And sweatshirts, hats, jackets. And um, so the portion of the store that dealt with um, class items was where the computers came from, is that correct? Yes. Did they have dressy clothes, like um, sports coats or suits there? No, they didn't. And did they have watches there? Not that I recall. Now, um, I believe you indicated that um, Lyle Menendez was on some, you believe that Lyle was on an allowance, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Do you know how much allowance he had for the month? No. Um, do you remember when you came back from spring break in California, um, having some difficulty getting the car out of the uh, parking lot? Yes. Okay. And what was the difficulty? Um, we had both been gone for some time. And, uh, we took a red eye back Monday evening, arrived in Newark Tuesday morning. He had class. His car was parked in long term parking, and between the two of us, we didn't have enough money to get the car out of parking. And how much money did it require, if you remember? I don't remember, but it was more than we had. Do you remember how much you had? We had very little. Under <laughs> like <laughs> under 10 bucks between the two. Did you go someplace to uh, get funds at that time? He called his grandmother, who lived um, within 10 miles or so. OK, do you see the grandmother in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. OK, is she seated in the audience section to your left? Yes, she is. 
And it's the um, woman in the second row with the polka dot blouse on? Yes. And did she, in fact, give money to Lyle? Uh, yes, she did. Do you remember approximately how much? Fifty. How long did that fifty dollars last? Several hours. That was gone? <coughs> gone by that evening, yeah. Now, at some point while you were um, living in the room with Lyle, did he make a comment to you at the end of a telephone call he had with his father? Um, About something his father had done to his mother? Yes. And after he hung up the phone, what did you tell you? I think that we had spoke earlier about um, his father's relationship with another woman. And I think the phone call triggered something and he turned and said, I could kill my father for what he did to my mom. So at that point, um, when he said, I could kill my father for what he did to my mom, did you feel like he was actually going to go out right then and kill him? No, no, no. Okay. Did the, um, at that time that he made the statement, did it, did it alarm you? No. Okay. Uh, but when you said for what he did to my mom, what was the context of that? What was your understanding about what the father had done to my uh, mom? From my understanding, his father had another relationship and uh, put his mom under a lot of stress and she attempted suicide. Now, during the period of time that you and Lyle were friends, did you and he discuss anything to do with what you wanted to do in the future in terms of making money or business or anything in that regard? Yes. Could you describe to the jury the kinds of conversations you had with him? So many. <laughs> um, just a couple? Well, just, yeah, generally, what was the theme of these conversations? Uh, the theme, the idea that we had was to just raise quick capital and do some investing, whether it be restaurants or businesses or anything. We had many schemes to come out with some um, instant cash. Now, at the time that you were uh, living in Princeton, were you familiar with a restaurant called Chuck's Spring Street Cafe? Yes. Okay. And could you tell me what kind of restaurant it was? It was a little local college hangout that served really, really hot wings and uh, just sodas and stuff. Did Lila ever express any interest in that restaurant to you? Yes, he did. Okay. What, what did he tell you about Chuck's Spring Street Cafe? Well, we, had, we were in this having a lunch one time and uh, Gus, who I was under the assumption he was the manager. Okay, um, let me just interrupt for a second. A man named Gus, G-U-S? Yes. Okay, and what did Gus do or say? Gus came over and he was very friendly with Lyle and uh, um, Lyle spoke of his opening trip to California and that Gus said, oh, I can't wait to get out of this cold weather and Lyle said that he would look for a place out there and we started talking about maybe franchising Gus. It was a great concept in California. So we, we had spoken to him about, you know, he wanted to get out of Princeton area and, and we wanted to do business and we had similar goals. After you left Princeton in the um, spring of 1989, by the way, how far is it from Princeton to New York, New York City? It's about an hour drive. And after you left, did you ever return to Princeton? Uh, yes, I did. When, when and for how long? It was, it must have been the, the spring of 1990 after all the reports and the murders came out. Um, okay, now I, let, me, let me just ask you the next question, okay? Was this before or after he'd been arrested? Lyle had been oh, arrested. Oh, after. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Any cross-examination on this? Yes, Mr. Goudreau, in the, uh, this store at the university, is this a small shop or is it a big building? It's a pretty good-sized place. And downstairs, do they have um, food for sale? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Do they have a travel agency? Yes, they do. And in terms of the clothing they sell, do they sell things, shirts like the shirt that Lyle was wearing? Yeah, they would sell a sweater like that, but it'd have a little Princeton logo on them. And they sell a shirt like the shirt he's wearing? Uh, not, not really like that, no. More like paraphernalia for Princeton campus. OK. And what, do they sell shoes? and? Gosh, I don't remember if they had shoes or not. Were you in there very often? We'd gone there several times, but we always had something in mind. We went there and we never browsed. Okay. When, uh, when you would shop in that, in that store, would Lyle use a credit card or sign for it, or would he use cash? He would use his uh, campus ID and sign for things. Okay. And did you eat in restaurants with him ever? Yes, I did. And would he use cash or would he use credit cards? His credit card wasn't good. 
so we always used cash. So he never, you never saw him use a credit card? One time we tried to use the credit card. Okay, but on no other occasions? No. And did you pay for your own meals or did he pay for you? It went back and forth. When I had money, I paid for my own and his, if I had money. And if I didn't, he would take care of it. Who paid more often? Um, he did. So when you, he got the $50 from his grandmother, I take it he had to use the money to get the car? We used the money originally for uh, two train tickets to get down to Princeton. He had to be in English by 9.30, and we arrived at 6.30. His grandma picked us up a little after 7, and we were trying to get down there in time. Okay. Would it be fair to say that when he had money, he spent it? Yes. And um, did he buy presents for people, for his girlfriends or whatever? If you know? No, not that I know. Okay. And uh, Mrs. Bazanich asked you about the comment uh, about uh, he could kill his dad. Yes. Is, was there anything about that comment that made you think he was going to go out and kill his father? No, but it showed that he was pretty hurt over what had happened to his mother, but I took it very lightly. Okay, so is it the same as people who say, Oh, I could kill my neighbor for doing this or my teacher for doing that. It's just a comment. Yes. And it wasn't actually a threat? No. Okay. And um, did he take you with him to his grandfather's grave site? Yes, he did. Uh, one time. Was it cold? Very cold. And how long were you there? Three, four hours. Okay. And was he talking mm -hmm. about his family history and the responsibility of being a child of people with this kind of a heritage? Yes, we just come from his grandmother's house. We drive back to Princeton, and he stopped by there. And uh, at his grandmother's house, we'd gone over all the old photo albums and their history coming from Cuba. And, and so that was what was on his mind. And we stopped by his grandfather's grave, and he told me how much he missed his grandfather and what a great influence he was on him. And then he spoke of his father. And the photo albums? Whose idea was it for you to go through all the old photo albums? Laz. And why did he want you to go through the photo albums? He just wanted me to know the history of the family and I, you know, where they came from and the type of people they were. Did he seem to want you to be close and to know a lot about him? Yes. Thank you. I've nothing further. Any further uh, direct? No. No. All right. Um, All right, we'll take a recess then at this time, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll resume tomorrow um, at, um, let me ask, um, are, is there going to be a need for a hearing in regards to Mr. Stevens before his testimony? Yes. How long will that take? Five minutes. Okay. All right, we'll have you come back then, ladies and gentlemen, tomorrow at 9 o'clock, uh, report to this courtroom. Uh, don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any opinions about it. And it's also very important that uh, you not speculate or wonder or be concerned about any of the proceedings that took place involving the other defendant and the other jury. Uh, your decision must be made only on the evidence that's presented to you in regards to the defendant, uh, Lyle Menendez, and the evidence that you hear in this courtroom and the instructions I give you on the law. So we'll be in recess tomorrow until uh, 9 o'clock and report back to this courtroom and we'll resume um, at 9 o'clock. Thank you all very much. While um, we're still in session, uh, I'll permit counsel to make inquiry outside the presence of the jury in regards to the area of Ms. Lansing that you had discussed at the sidebar. Thank you. Mr. Goudreau, did you have a conversation with Lyle Menendez in a Chinese restaurant one evening? Yes. And can you tell me what that conversation was? Um, I think what you're referring to was uh, towards the end of my stay at Princeton. We had had a dinner at a Chinese food restaurant late at night. It was coming, school was coming to a close. There was a lot of pressure on him. And uh, we were talking about our plans for the summer and the future. And uh, all the chairs were up on the tables around us, and they were just waiting for us to leave. And we just talked about, he started 
let me ask a question. Okay. Did you reveal something about your own background of a personal nature yes, to Lyle? And did he, in response to that, reveal something to you about his and his brother's background? No. Did he ever tell you that he and his brother had been molested by their father? No, he didn't. Have you ever told me that? Um, I can't recall that I have. Have you ever told anyone else that? Um, I can't recall that I have. You don't remember whether you've ever told me or anyone else that I'm, Lyle Menendez told you that he and his brother were molested by their father I in a Chinese him. restaurant? I told him I was molested as a child. He never told me he was. He never said anything to you of that nature? No. And you have never told anybody that he said anything of that nature? Is that true or not true? It's true that I don't, I never told anybody that I said that. I was under the assumption that uh, by his reaction that he had had problems, but it was only an assumption. And it is your testimony here that you have never told anyone that he told you of this incident with his parents, with his father? No, never told anybody. Thank you. All right, uh, anything else? <laughs> Mr. Goudreau, did you ever have an interview with a reporter in this case on tape in which you made that statement? I interviewed with Bob Rand, was the only reporter I interviewed on tape, so may you have been You've him. interviewed with a number of reporters in this case, haven't you? Yes, I have. How many, who have you been, who have you been interviewed by in this case? Uh, Bob Rand, Ron Sobel, and some gentleman from the US One newspaper in Princeton area. Okay, and is it your testimony that you have never in any of those interviews made this statement? I can't recall that I have, no. Don't you think you would remember if you had? Oh, sure. So is it your testimony that you haven't? It's my testimony that I haven't. Thank you. All right, anything else? Oh. Touch on other issues. Um, yeah, but as far as this witness is concerned, uh, anything further? No, you can't. Okay, we'll uh, excuse you today, but I understand they want you back tomorrow until the, at least the conclusion of the testimony regarding another witness. So your orders remain until excused tomorrow. Okay. All right? And um, you can leave the courtroom now. Oh, great. Okay. And um, there are some scheduling matters we can discuss and other procedural matters that we can discuss with counsel. And um, at this point, uh, the purpose is just to obtain some information about what transpired. So is it the people who intend to call these witnesses? I thought that Ms. Lansing was going to call Mr. Goudreau. I, I can, it doesn't matter who calls the witnesses. Either one. I, our intention was to play the tape. He had indicated yesterday in response to my questions about what he had, whether he had this discussion with me and whether he had had a more specific discussion with Mr. Rand was that he didn't remember. And so I was going to play this tape with his voice on it to see if that refreshed his recollection. So I suspect at that point in time, Mrs. Bizanich was going to want to elicit information from him with regard to the source of that information. That's correct. All right. Well, is I'll Mr. Goudreau here? Okay. <laughs> we're a little, we were a little concerned about the fact that the jury might be able to hear the TV. I don't know if the court's concerned about that, but I thought it was They're not talking very loud. Well, one of the uh, problems is that there is sound transference. You can't really distinguish what's being said, but you can certainly hear sound. Um, what we'll do is keep the sound down on the um, player here so it's not too loud. All right, uh, state your name again for the record, please. Uh, Donovan Goudreau. Okay, Mr. Goudreau, you're still under oath. Mr. Goudreau, yesterday afternoon, I think we left off by my asking you whether you remembered having a conversation with a journalist with regard to a dinner you had at a Chinese restaurant with Lyle. Do you remember my asking you those questions? Yes, I do. And I believe that your answer yesterday was that you did not recall. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And 
Were you telling the truth that you did not recall? Yes, I was. All right. I would like to show you a tape now to see if that refreshes your recollection. Can I just see Mark the court to do this, please? And I think there's no need for the reporter to. Or is it stipulated the court reporter need not take down what's on the tape? So stipulated. Yeah. Well, all right, and this will be marked as uh, court exhibit A for this hearing. Sure. Why don't you keep the sound down? Stand in the morning for more testimony. 
Now, I should point out the reports of sexual abuse in the family and the boys' self-defense claim only surfaced publicly a few weeks ago. The audio interview you heard, the interview given to journalist Robert Grant, took place more than one year ago. Pat, David? Well, Jim, do you think that as a result of this uh, new information that has come out, the change that, of course, will be aired exclusively on Prime 9 News tonight, that Goudreau could be recalled? No, it doesn't. So you still have no memory of that conversation with Mr. Rand? No, I don't. Are you saying that that conversation never took place? No, it obviously took place. I just don't remember the conversation. Do you recognize your voice? Yes, I do. That is your voice? Yes, it is. And did you uh, interview with Mr. Rand? Um, yes, I did. How many times? I couldn't say. Um, there was the one time on tape, but then there was probably a couple phone conversations <laughs> we had over a period of a year or two. Do you remember telling me that you used to have lunch with him occasionally? He would come into the city <laughs> and offer to buy us lunch. Who's that? Bob Rand. Well, people, when he came to the East Coast, he would try to meet with Glenn and myself. But as to you, so when he would come in and ask to buy you lunch? Yeah. Did you have lunch with him? Yes, I did. Okay, so in addition to the interview on tape, you had lunch with him several times? I wouldn't say several times, maybe twice. Mm -hmm. And several phone calls? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. I'm looking Mr. Goudreau, do you know how many um, hours of tape interview you gave to Mr. Rand? Um, I was unaware, unaware of it until yesterday when I saw, or someone brought it to my attention, that it was several hours. I was. Okay. Do you have an independent recollection right now that... I'm sorry. That it was more than an hour, hour's worth of... Uh, oh, yes. All right. Now, Mr. Goodrow, um, did Lyle Menendez ever tell you that he had been sexually abused by either of his parents? No, never. Right. Um, now, I believe that you indicated on the stand yesterday that you had been sexually abused. Is that correct? Yes. Did you ever divulge that to Lyle Menendez? Yes, I did. Okay. Could you tell me the context in which it was that you and he had this discussion about your abuse? It was during that same dinner that, at the Chinese food restaurant that you just mentioned. And uh, I had told him that I was sexually abused as a child. All right, now, what prompted you to tell him that? Well, we were discussing how well we knew each other towards the end of the school year. We had spent a great amount of time together. And uh, he said he knew everything about me, and I told him, no, you know, there's something you don't know. And I thought he should know. And so I told him. And what did you tell him? I told him that I was sexually abused as a child. By whom? A friend of my father's. Not by your father, but a friend of your father's? Yes, that's true. And when you told him that, were you at this dinner? Uh, yeah, at the Chinese food restaurant. Okay. What was his reaction when you told him? Uh, he was very shaken. And did, how did he exhibit the fact that he was shaken? Um, he just sat there motionless, listened very intently. Tears were welling in his eyes. Did you have any further discussion with him at that time about the abuse that you had sustained? Um, outside of that dinner? No, during the dinner. Did you have any further discussion about this? No. Uh, did his reaction, um, did you know his reaction? In other words, was it peculiar to you or something? Yeah, it seemed peculiar. Okay, did you draw a conclusion from your view of Mr. Lyleman and his reaction to your news? Do you understand my question? No. Okay. What did you think when Lionel Hernandez reacted the way he did to what you told him? Um, well, I was uh, I was shocked. He was quite emotional when I told him what had happened. Did that cause you to question whether something like that might have happened to him? Oh, sure. All right. Yeah. Did he ever tell you at that time that something had happened to him? No. If he had told you, would you remember it? Um, probably. It was pretty, pretty big stuff back then. I would have remembered it. Okay. Do you remember the abuse that occurred to you? Oh, yes, very well. Do you have any further discussions with Lyle Menendez about your abuse after the Chinese re uh, restaurant dinner? No. Did he ever have any discussions with you about that? No. None whatsoever. At some point since the, um, the murders and the arrest in this case, did someone give you information that the, uh, Mr. Menendez had taken baths with his son? I'm assuming so from hearing the tape. 
that I must have heard it from somewhere. Move to strike the answer your own speculation. Did Mr. Rand give you information at the time that he interviewed you? It was, uh, yeah, we found out. I was kind of isolated on the East Coast. There wasn't very much in the papers or news media. And uh, therefore, he kind of told us, kind of brought us up to date on the I say us, meaning some of the people who were stranded out there not knowing where this whole thing was going. I'm going to guess to anything that took place out of his presence, unless these people were there at this conversation. Well, the objection sustained, the answer is not responsive. Ask the question. Well, there's no objection sustained. Okay. Um, Mr. Rand, during the time that you personally spoke with Mr. Rand, did Mr. Rand ever give you information about the Menendez murder case? Yes, he did. And do you know where you got the information that um, one or both of the defendants took baths with the father? Do I know where I got that information? Yes. I can't recall. There's only two or three people who were closely associated with the case who I had contact with, and that would have been. I'm going to object. He's answered the question. I can't recall. Have you finished your answer? No. Bob Rand or Glenn Stevens. Now, um, do you remember the entirety of the conversation that you had with Mr. Rand, a portion of which was just played for you on the television? Do I remember the entire conversation? Yes. No, not at all. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I would ask, I've subpoenaed the tape for Mr. Rand. I think the whole tape needs to be played for Mr. Goudreau to put this in context. Are there any further questions of this? No, not at this time. Okay, any further? Just briefly, if I may. Uh, Mr. Goudreau, did you speak to Mr. Rand within the last two weeks? Yes. And did he ask you specifically about this particular conversation? Not that I recall. Did he, did you, do you remember having a conversation with him in which he asked you what you were going to do about the discussion, about the conversation in the Chinese restaurant? <coughs> From what I remember the conversation, we never spoke of what I was going to say. No. To Mr. Goudreau, my question is this. You said you spoke to Mr. Rand within the last two weeks. Is that correct? Yes. And was that by telephone or in person? By telephone. And when you spoke to him by telephone, isn't it true that he asked you if you were going to tell publicly the story about the Chinese restaurant? No. You never had any discussion with him about whether you were going to? Not that I recall. I can't remember any. And this was just two weeks ago? This is just recently, yeah. The other thing was you said that you got information about this case from Mr. Rand and Mr. Stevens? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're the only two people I had contact with. And did you ever have any conversations with Mr. Stevens about whether Lyle or Eric were abused by their parents? No. So the information couldn't have come from Mr. Stevens, is that correct? I'm not saying, I, know, I don't know where the information came from. I obviously said it. I don't know where I heard it. OK, well, you've told us the only place you got information about this case with regard to, to this, inf this specific information would have been Mr. Rand or Mr. Stevens. My question of you is, did you ever have any discussions with Glenn Stevens with regard to whether Lyle or Eric was abused by their father as a child? Yes, I did. <clears throat> When did you have those conversations with Mr. Stevens? Over the past couple days. And did you have any conversations with him prior to that? Not that I recall, no. Do you remember having a photograph taken which appeared in Los Angeles Times Magazine of you and Mr. Stevens? Yes, I did. And that was several years ago, is that correct? Yes, it was. And do you remember having any conversations with him on that occasion with regard to whether there was any sexual abuse in this family? No. So what you're saying to us now is the information about taking baths could not have come from Mr. Stevens. Is that correct? I'm not saying that at all. It could have come from Mr. Stevens? Yes, it could have. And I don't remember hearing it or where I heard it from. That's what I'm saying. But the only places it could have come from, I think you said, were either Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand? Quite possibly, yes. Or from Lyle Menendez? I don't think he ever mentioned anything about his father abusing him. That you remember? Or you're not sure? I'm pretty sure he never did. Thank you.
Mr. Goudreau, the photograph that I've referred to, which appears in Los Angeles Times Magazine of you and Mr. Stevens, that we referred to earlier, you remember that when that photograph was taken? Not exactly when it was taken, but it was after Lyle's arrest. Okay. And <coughs> did you go to Princeton because the Los Angeles Times reporters wanted to photograph you there? Uh, yes, I did. And at the time that you and Mr. Stevens were photographed together, did you have any conversation at that time as to whether Lyle had ever revealed to either of you anything about the abuse in his family, the sexual abuse of either him or Eric? I can't remember if we did or not. And when you had this conversation with Mr. Rand just a couple of weeks ago uh, with regard to whether you were going to talk about the conversation at the Chinese restaurant, did you understand my question to mean, did you talk to Mr. Rand about whether you were going to reveal in open court the fact that Lyle had revealed to you that he and his brother were abused by their father, were sexually abused? I don't remember saying that to him. I don't remember talking about it. But you might have? Sure. I, it was just two weeks ago. If, if I said something, I think I'd remember it, but I can't remember the conversation verbatim, so. But do you remember discussing with him the topic of no, whether I don't. you would reveal in open court that Lyle had made these disclosures to you regarding himself and his brother? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Do you remember having the conversation with Mr. Rand at that time, this conversation a few weeks ago, about whether you would be revealing in open court that Lyle had told you that he and his brother were sexually abused? Do you remember having that conversation with Mr. Rand? No. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Yes, Mr. Goudreau, if, if you recall that Lyle Menendez had said this to you, would you tell the truth? Oh, in a second. Would, would you help Lyle if you could? I would just tell the truth, whether it hurt him or helped him. The photograph referred to by the defense attorney before he went to Princeton, was that a posed photograph? Oh, no, not at all. We were both unaware that it was being taken. Now, you saw on the monitor just now Mr. Rand talking about you and you heard an excerpt of the tape. Is, did you make assumptions on your own about whether or not Lyle Menendez was going to use Yes, I did. And what were those assumptions based on? Based on uh, his initial reaction to me telling him about my sexual abuse and just through <laughs> living with him and hearing about his problems with his father, just putting the pieces together in my own head. So you've drawn the conclusion in your own mind, haven't you, that it's possible he was sexually abused? Yes. And that is your state of mind, is that correct? Yes. Okay. But if that is, in fact, your state of mind, do you think you would recall a specific report of sexual abuse to you by Lyle? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'm not All right, anything else? Okay, you may step down. Okay. You played part of this tape from Ms. Lansing, is that correct? That's correct. And when was it you played her the tape? It was in, uh, let's see, approximately, uh, uh, I believe sometime in May or maybe the end of April of 1993. So that was this year? Yes. Did you also play portions of the tape for um, anyone from the team of Mr. Eric Hernandez? No. Okay. Now, what was your purpose in playing the tape for Ms. Lansing? I am writing a book for Simon & Schuster, and in the course of my research, I interview many different people. So I was trying to do some research about some of the topics that were raised by Mr. Goudreau. And so I approached Ms. Lansing and asked for an off-the-record interview regarding uh, some of the information in my interview. Did you ever come to the prosecution with the same information and ask for comment? Uh, no, I didn't. Why not? Because I understood that the prosecution was not doing interviews. I had spoken to Mike Petula uh, a number of times and asked for interviews with the prosecution. I was told they were not doing interviews until after the trial. Do you remember interviewing me? Yes. Okay, and do you remember during that interview, you told me that the prosecution had a better witness than I think it was Craig Signorelli? Do you remember, do you remember yes. telling me that? Do you remember me asking you who that witness was? Yes. Remember you telling me you wouldn't tell me? That's correct. Okay, but you did make this information available to the defense, is that correct? Which information are you speaking of? About Donovan withdrawal. Which specific information? The tape. I didn't play an entire tape, I played a very small portion of a tape. How much money are you getting for writing this book? We're not going to object to this. I think this is really irrelevant and off the key. All right, objection sustained. Okay. Mr. Rand, how come you never played that for the prosecution? We're going to make the same objection. It's irrelevant. How come? Objection overruled. 
I was told that the pro I approached uh, the press information officer for the district attorney's office and had asked a number of times uh, since my return to California last year for interviews with the uh, with yourself and with Mr. Kuriyama and was told that interviews were not being were not available. Did you tell any of those people the kind of information that you have on the Don Newberg? <coughs> no. So you just asked generally for interviews, that's correct? That's correct. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I would ask for access to the tape. I don't know if it's appropriate to take the first time to play the entire tape, but um, before we conclude with Mr. Goudreau and send him on his way, I would like to hear the entire tape, and not only the one that's here in court today, but the other hour and a half that uh, Mr. Rand has. Well, let's get some more information about what this tape is, um, how it was created, and what's on it. All right. Um, the two and a half hours that you have tape was, I believe, indicated to the number period two days, is that correct? That's correct. What portion of the two and a half hours um, deals with the area of abuse, be it sexual or physical? I would say it's about five minutes. Okay, is that part of the portion, or is the portion that was on television last night part of this five minutes? The portion that was on television was approximately 15 seconds out of that five minutes. All right, do you have that particular part of the tape cue? No, I do not. All right, could you find it if I gave you a tape recorder for five minutes? Yes. All right. May I approach, please? Yes. Well, let's not do it yep. now. We can go ahead and ask other questions. All right. Now, um, <coughs> you indicated, uh, and I don't have a transcript of what was on television, but it's, is it your contention that uh, that Mr. Goudreau told you that the defendants have been sexually abused? Yes. All right. Now, in the portion of the tape that we viewed, it appears that you were asking him a number of leading questions. Is that correct? I asked him a number of questions. That's what a reporter does. All right, and if those questions, then you would not characterize the pleading, is that correct? Objection, this is just argument. Overall. Overall. You can answer the question. Uh, could you repeat the question? You would not characterize the questions you asked of Mr. Boudreaux, which were played on Channel 9 News, as um, leading, is that correct? No, it was in the context of a, an anecdote he was telling me about uh, Lyle Menendez complaining about uh, Jose Menendez sexually abusing Eric and Lyle. All right, and that was contained in a portion that was on television? That's correct. What was your motivation in going to Channel 9 News last night? Objection, Your Honor, relative. Why did you do it? It was Mr. Goudreau had been a witness, and it was uh, a newsworthy event, and they asked if they could, they knew I had some information, and asked if they could interview me. Were you interested in garnering publicity for your upcoming book? No, I wasn't, uh, Ms. Bazanich. My book will not be released until probably next spring or summer, so I have nothing to gain by doing an interview. A number of reporters have asked to interview me because of my experience of spending almost four years researching this story. You have a financial interest in the outcome of this case, don't you? I'm a reporter and I work for a living. And you have a financial interest in the outcome of the case? No. Do you have other interviews of other prosecution witnesses that you would provide to us? No. As, a, as a reporter, I... Uh, will stand behind the California Shield Law and uh, will, do not wish to uh, reveal unpublished material. Okay. Do you, in fact, have interviews with other witnesses for the prosecution of this case? Yes. And you are refusing to give that to the prosecution, is that correct? Yes. Why is it you will give information to the defense and not the prosecution? I didn't give information. What I was doing was an interview. In the course of an interview, Sometimes you reveal information. It's the same thing that I believe prosecutors and police do. That sometimes you reveal information to gain other information. That is what I was doing. Are you a police officer? No, I'm a reporter. This is just argumentative. Right. Let's get back to what I said. All right. How was this tape generated? <coughs> circumstances of it. That's sort of okay. Where were you when you made when you had this conversation with Mr. Woodrow? In his apartment in New York City. And. Um, did he consent to the interview with you? Yes, he did. And did he know it was being tape recorded? Yes, the tape recorder was on the table. What were you doing when you were interviewing him? What was your purpose in interviewing him? My purpose in interviewing him was in the course of the research for my book for Simon & Schuster, I have interviewed over 300 people. Mr. Goudreau was one of those 300 people. So the purpose of your interviewing was uh, in preparation for? In, in research for my uh, book, I interviewed Mr. Goudreau. And you were working exclusively on your book at that point? That's correct. I, I signed a contract with Simon & Schuster in, Mar in October of 1991. All right, so you were working on the book gathering information, correct? That's correct. All right, and aside from what was on television last night, what else did Mr. Goudreau tell you about this area of sexual abuse? I do not wish to go into unpublished material. Your Honor, 
at this time that people would ask that that um, entire five minute portion be revealed to the prosecution. It appears to me that you can't wait part in at all. Well, let's get to some specifics here. Would you play five <coughs> minutes uh, for the people on Channel 9 News? No, I played uh, 20 seconds. Okay, and uh, that's all you played for the people on Channel 9? That's correct. How much did you play for the defense? Um, approximately, I'm not sure, it was maybe about uh, eight to ten minutes. I, I, I don't recall exactly. All right, uh, did that eight to ten minutes include this portion that uh, was played on television last night? Yes, it did. All right, and um, the conversation you had more recently with Mr. Boudreau, was that tape recorded? No, it was not. And did you go into the specifics uh, with Mr. Boudreau of your <coughs> testimony in regards to the uh, alleged statement made to him by uh, Lyle Menendez of being molested? I don't wish to uh, go into that. It's unpublished material, and I do, it deals with a source. All right. Uh, the source being Mr. Goudreau? Correct. The same source that you disclosed to the world on Channel 9 News uh, last night? I disclosed a, a very limited uh, portion of, of information. All right. And you feel that you uh, qualify under the California Shield Law? Yes, I do. All right. And is your lawyer en route? to argue that matter? Uh, he's, he is in, in court this morning, but he would be available after lunch. All right, and when you acquired the information at issue here, the question is whether or not you were employed by or connected with any news association or press association or magazine, newspaper, or other periodical publication. Yes, I, I was, uh, I uh, signed a contract with Simon & Schuster, Inc. in October of 1991 in preparation for a book to be released uh, after the conclusion of this trial. And when was uh, the interview in question? The interview was in March 1992. And was it the interview conducted solely for the purpose of preparing the book? Well, it was conducted primarily in preparation for the book. However, I am continuing. I've been uh, regularly supplying stories to the Miami Herald Sunday Magazine, Tropic Magazine, since 1988 and they have expressed continued interest and I have also occasionally at their request written stories for the daily newspaper and that association which began uh, in August of 1989 when the Miami Herald uh, paid for me to come to California to research the story has con that association continues to this day. All right, do uh, counsel wish to inquire either the prosecution or defense counsel? Yes, sir. Mr. Ryan, in addition to writing stories about this case, you've also been interviewed by other media as a witness, is that correct? No. Well, I believe you indicated this morning that you have been interviewed by other news media. Yes. And that's in regard to your knowledge of the case? Yes. All right. In uh, March of 1992, uh, were you employed by the Miami Herald? I was not a staff reporter of the Miami Herald. I was not a staff writer. However, I continued an association which began in uh, 1988 with the Miami Herald. When's the last time you wrote an article for the Miami Herald? Uh, the last time I wrote an article was in May of 1993 when I wrote an article about this case. And the time before that? December of 1989 was the last published article. I have supplied other information and files to the Miami Herald uh, over the entire course of the story. So you only have had those two published articles? So the May 1993 article has not been published yet. It is going to be published sometime soon. I was informed this past uh, Friday. Defense wish to inquire? No, I have. Well, let me ask uh, Mr. Burt, uh, have you obtained from Mr. Rand the eight to ten minutes that uh, you were seeking in this matter? No, Your Honor, we haven't obtained any uh, tape from Mr. Rand. The only Are you assured that he'll give that to you, therefore you don't have any questions of him? I'm sorry. Are you assured that he's going to give that to you and provide that to you since you felt you needed it to conduct your examination? I think his position is he's not going to give it to either side. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. The portion that was played to uh, Mr. Burt and Ms. Lansing, is it your position you would not turn that over to them? That's correct. And why is that? I feel that uh, because of the California press shield law and as a resident of Florida, under the Florida press shield law, that I should not be forced to uh, uh, turn over unpublished materials. Well, had you not published it to uh, Mr. Burt when you played it to him on the radio or on the telephone, rather? 
Uh, it was an off-the-record uh, exchange of a server and a source. And who is the source? Mr. Bird. And therefore, you felt that was not a publication? No, Your Honor. Is that, that's correct. You that's that's my feeling. A publication. And um, did you wish to pursue that at all, Mr. Bird, or are you well, satisfied with the answers? To clarify to the court, it wasn't revealed to me in a phone conversation. I actually met with Mr. Rand this morning, and that's when he laid that second. It was in person. It was not. But I don't have anything to All right. I, I had assumed that that was done to you in the same time frame it was played for uh, Ms. Lansing. Uh, yeah. Ms. Lansing, you heard this some earlier time, is that right? I heard 25 seconds worth of material several months ago. I thought it was about six months ago. I think he said it was in May. Could well be the case. He played for me the part that was on the air and one sentence beyond that. I couldn't give it him played a much longer section for Mr. Bird this morning. And this was in an effort to accumulate information from Mr. Burt. Is that why you played it for him? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, uh, did you, uh, all right, anybody else have any further questions? Uh, Ms. Abramson, you had something. about this information that Donovan Goudreau had given you. Yes. And uh, I wasn't giving you any information during that discussion, was I? I don't recall specifically the conversation. I'd have to go back to refer to my notes. And we hadn't set up any kind of confidential, off-the-record communication. <laughs> no, it wasn't a formal uh, interview situation. We ran into each other in the hallway. <laughs> right, and <clears throat> you told me when I was talking to you in the hallway that Donovan Goudreau had told you that Lyle Menendez had told him that he and his brother had been molested by their father. That's correct. I was uh, preparing a story at that time for the Miami Herald, and I was trying to get your reaction to that information. Well, you didn't tell me that's why you were telling me. In fact, right, that, that was what was going on. In fact, I, uh, I started the conversation. I was sort of angry with you. Do you remember that? Uh, it's probably true. Okay. I've never heard. Mr. Bird, anything else? <clears throat> or the prosecution, any questions? Yes, Mr. Rand, um, last night the portion of the tape that you played for Channel 9 News did not contain Mr. Goudreau saying that Lyle Menendez had told him that he had been molested. Is that correct? I believe it did, but I would have to look at a transcript of it to be certain. Well, my impression was is that you, were, you mentioned sexual abuse and Mr. Goudreau popped in with something about the bath. I, I believe, uh, without having a transcript in front of me, I believe in the uh, portion that was aired on Channel 9 that uh, Mr. Goudreau said, uh, yeah, Eric and Lyle, too, they took baths together. That is not Mr. Goudreau saying that Lyle told him that, correct? Correct. Now, did you tell Glenn Stevens about them taking baths together? Do you remember doing that? I'd have to refer to my notes. I've interviewed uh, over 300 people and have thousands of pages of notes uh, over the course of the four years since I began researching the story. Were you aware of the fact that that had occurred, that the, that the boys had taken, as children, little children, had taken baths with the, uh, their father or something to that effect? I uh, believe Mr. Uh, Goudreau had, <coughs> well, I, I believe Mr. Goudreau had, had spoken of that. No, did you know that? Did I know that? Yeah. Did you I, tell that? I wasn't there. Were you ever told that in your investigation of this case? I would have to refer to my notes to be sure. I don't think further are. Mr. Burt? Just to clarify, uh, Mr. Rand, you made reference to the fact that you played a segment of the tape for me this morning. Is that correct? Yes. And is it true that uh, that meeting with you and I came about because I asked you for a copy of the story tape that was played last night on Channel 9? Yes. I came over to your house this morning to pick up that uh, Yes. VCR tape, correct? Yes. And at that point you asked me um, whether I wanted to hear the five to eight minute portion of the tape that referred to 
Mr. Goudreau's statement concerning Lyle Menendez stating to him he had been abused and also repeating that statement to Mr. Stevens at some later point, is that correct? Yes. Was there any further discussion between the two of us at that point? No, there wasn't. Right. That's all I have. Thank you. Anything else? Did you wish to ask questions of your client? No. I would have yes. Mr. Rand, this portion that you played for Mr. Burke this morning, was that the only place in your interview with Mr. Boudreau where the issue of Lyle and Eric being sexually abused by their father was discussed with Mr. Boudreau? No, I believe there may be one other uh, segment in the interview. All right, anything else? No, thank you. Okay. Are you currently employed by any newspaper? I am not a staff employee. However, I have a continuing working relationship with the Miami Herald. What does that mean? When you submit an article, they might or might not publish it? Well, they have asked me to, to call them uh, regularly to provide information on what is happening in this case. And they have asked me uh, to write articles as the case goes along. I, I have also I published an article in Paris Match magazine in France uh, several weeks ago. Are you employed by Paris Match magazine? Uh, no, Your Honor, I'm not a staff employee. However, I have uh, written articles for them uh, several times over the past few years. Okay, anything else? Was again paid very recently by the Herald, I believe it is, by the Herald for um, another such story. And therefore, as to him, in this particular case, I think the shield law does apply and should apply. All right. Uh, well, anything further from anybody? No, Your Honor. All right. Based upon what has been presented to me, I find that Mr. Rand conducted this interview of Mr. Goudreau at a time when he was neither connected with or employed by any news organization. Um, whether it be a newspaper, a magazine, or other periodical publication, or press association, or wire service, that he uh, conducted this interview solely uh, in preparation for a book that he was writing. He so testified this morning, and uh, the court finds in both the reviewing his testimony this morning and this afternoon that that is how uh, and why the interview occurred. Therefore, the shield law under Section 1070 of the Evidence Code does not apply to Mr. Rand. It uh, was written to apply to a certain limited class of individuals, and Mr. Rand does not uh, fall within that class. He is neither employed by or associated with any of those organizations enumerated in Section 1070. Therefore, he cannot claim the uh, shield that is provided by Section 1070 of the Evidence Code. Therefore, the court would order that uh, Mr. Rand turn over uh, to the person that subpoenaed the documents, the, video, the audio tape that is an issue in this case. All right, to the prosecution, and, and counsel can uh, have an opportunity to review it before we get to the testimony here, so. Mr. Goudreau, you had a number of interviews with a reporter named Bob Rand, is that correct? Yes. And at least one of them was conducted while being tape recorded. Is that correct? Yes. I'd like to direct your attention to various areas of your testimony here before and re-ask some of the questions based on that interview so you'll understand what the source is. All right? Fine. Um, you had testified here that uh, Lyle had very little money prior to his parents' death. Is that correct? Yes. You seem to hesitate. Are you unsure of that? or? Well, he had more than I did, but yes, very little. Um, do you remember telling Mr. Rand that you ate lunch out every day, you and Lyle? No. Is it your testimony that you did not tell him that? Um. I don't recall telling him that. It's not the truth. So if you told Miss, if your voice is on the tape saying that, then that's a lie. Is that correct? I wouldn't, I don't think I could remember why I would say we ate lunch out every day. 
I'm not asking you why. I'm asking you if your voice appears on tape saying you ate lunch out every day in an interview with Bob Rand, then you would have been lying to Bob Rand. Is that correct? Objection calls for speculation. Overall. Like Overall. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. You told us here the other day that uh, Lyle did not pay the bill for you, pick up the tab very often. Is that correct? Um, no, he picked up the tab. Regularly? Yes, he did. Do you remember telling Mr. Rand that Lyle was always buying dinner and margaritas for the two of you? No, I don't recall that. Did Lyle buy dinner and margaritas regularly for the two of you? I can only recall eating there once with Lyle and whether or not he paid the check I cannot remember. So if your voice appears on that tape saying he was always buying dinner and margaritas would you have been lying to Mr. Rand at that time? I have no idea. Well do you think your memory was better when you were interviewed by Mr. Rand or do you think you just told different stories? I think I can't re recall. I don't remember exactly how or why I said that. Well, would you have said it if it was false? Um, I'm not sure under the circumstances. So you might have said it if it was false? I may have not wanted to imply that Lyle was buying me dinner all the time, sure. No, but you told him that he was buying you dinner. During, Lyle may have purchased dinner at this restaurant but whether or not I said it on the tape, I can't recall. No, no, no. What I'm asking, you said, you said, assume you said on the tape, Lyle was always buying me dinner and margaritas. My question of you, is that true? Was Lyle always buying you dinner and margaritas? Is that true? No. Okay, so you would have been lying to Mr. Rand if, you, if that's on the tape. Objection, argumentative. Overruled. Yes. Okay. If on the tape your voice indicates Lyle loved, I'm sorry, Lyle loaned money to people all the time, is that true or false? That's true. Okay. And the ticket that Lyle sent you to come out to California, was that ticket worth about $300? Yes, it was. And did you ever pay him for it? No, I didn't. Do you remember at this time whether both his father and mother called the morning that you had to leave that dorm room? Do I remember which one of the two called? Or do you remember if it was both? Um, I do remember someone called. I think it was his father. If on the tape your voice says, first mom, then dad called, do you think your memory was better when you were interviewed by Mr. Rand a couple years ago than it is now? Um, the assumes facts not in evidence that it was two years ago. Perhaps we can establish. I'm sorry, it was March of 92, right. a year and a half. Can you repeat the question? Yes. On the tape, you say, first mom called, then dad. And I'm asking you now if your memory was better in March of 92 when you were interviewed by Mr. Rand than it is now. I can't answer that. I don't. Pertaining to that question, if my memory was better back then as it is now? Mm hmm. Uh, I wouldn't have said it unless, I wouldn't have said his mom called unless she really did. Okay, so uh, should we assume then that that is the correct statement, that first mom called, then dad? Yes. Okay. Did you fly first class when uh, you flew home with Lyle? No. 
you remember telling Mr. Rand that you flew first class coming back from Los Angeles? I think I used first class in a figure of speech. What, what figure Well, we speeches? always went, everywhere we went was first class. And did you have the money to go everywhere first class, or did Lyle have the money? Neither Lyle nor myself had the money at the time. So how did you go first class? I just answered that. I, we always traveled well. We had his father's car out in Los Angeles, and we traveled on the planes. We, uh, there was no one seating. It was a red-eye flyback, so there was no one sitting anywhere, so we went up sitting in a better section. Okay. But when you did things with Lyle, I think you said you always did them first class in terms of just a general characterization of his lifestyle? Yes. When you left the dorm room at Princeton, did you find later that you had any property that belonged to Lyle? Yes, I did. And what was that? A uh, sweater. Did you ever make any effort to return the sweater to him? I attempted to call the dorm room afterwards, but not to return the sweater, no. Did you borrow $400 from Lyle? Cash? No. Do you remember telling Mr. Rand that you borrowed $400 from Lyle and that you thought that Lyle might have thought that you'd stolen it? No. I don't remember that at all. So if your voice is on the tape saying that, is that a lie? Or is that, do you think your memory was better then? Objection argumentative. Mm -hmm. I'm having a tough time answering these because these questions were asked a long time ago. I understand that. But there is a tape recording on which your voice appears saying that you borrowed $400 from Lyle and you thought that Lyle might have thought you had stolen it. Well, I'd have to understand the context of why I said that. It might help me remember whether or not I was referring to the plane ticket and an additional to something else. Well, the plane ticket's $300. Okay, so we're well, I'm talking- I'm aware of that. Okay, so now, do you remember borrowing $400 from Lyle on more than one occasion? I don't remember borrowing $400, no. So if that's what it says on the tape, then that would have been a lie? I can't answer that. I have no idea if it was a lie or not. I don't remember borrowing $400. Do you think that when you told Mr. Rand it might have been the truth and your memory was better a year and a half ago than it is now? I can't answer that. Same answer as last time. Do you remember telling Mr. Rand that uh, Lyle had told you that when he graduated, his dad was going to loan him $2 million to set him up in business? I remember Lyle had mentioned to me that, so I guess I would have returned, in return said that to Mr. Rand. Okay. Now, you told us about a situation in which uh, you and Lyle flew back from Los Angeles. He couldn't get his car out of long-term parking, and he, you had to borrow $50 from his grandmother. Do you remember telling us about that? His grandmother gave him $50. He didn't borrow it. Okay. She had owed him the money. Okay, so she was just giving him back the money she owed him. Uh, I was under the impression that was true. Okay. And well now, proceed with the testimony of Mr. Goudreau. Mr. Goudreau, you have uh, previously been sworn. I'd ask that you state your name again for the record. Donovan Goudreau. All right, um, Ms. Lansing. Thank you, Mr. Goudreau, you told us when you testified the other day that you had no contact with Lamanita from the day he left the dorm room until you received a letter from him just a few weeks ago. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. I would ask you to look at... a four-page document, which is 61. The first page is a letter from me on my stationery, and then three handwritten pages. <coughs> yes. And is that the letter you were referring to that you received from Lama Nettles? Yes. Several weeks ago? Yes, it is. And that's dated June of 1993? Yes. And 
Did that letter in any way suggest that you shouldn't testify or what you should say? No, not at all. And did it in any way threaten or intimidate you or make you feel that you shouldn't come here and testify? No. Any questioning on behalf of Eric Menendez? Anything by the prosecution? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. Mr. Goudreau, you were here in court on July 26, 1993, as a prosecution witness. Do you recall that? Yes. And at that time, I believe that you told us about your friendship with Lyle Menendez. Do you remember? Yes. And I asked you if there was a conversation which took place in a Chinese restaurant. Yes. Do you remember? And did such con a conversation take place? Yes. Was that in May of 1989, approximately? Late April, early May. Can you tell me what the, what the, the mood was of this uh, conversation in the Chinese restaurant? <coughs> what was going on? Um, I had known Lyle for several months up to that point. And uh, we had spent a lot of time together, bonded as friends, and got to know each other very well. It came towards the end of the school year. We were both making plans for the summer, future plans together. We decided to have dinner somewhere off of Palmer Square, some Chinese food place. It was late at night. Um, we at, <coughs> let me ask a question. At the time that you were having the conversation, were there a lot of people in the restaurant, or was it? I think when we first went in, it was clearing out. It was late at night, and then as the night went on, as dinner finished, I think it was empty, with only the staff waiting for us to land. Okay. And were the chairs put up on the table? Um, that yeah, I think I think actually the chairs were on the table. Okay. And what? type of conversation were you and Lyle Menendez having at that time? I forget how it started, but it was along the lines of, you know, we know everything about each other, and um, Lyle asked if there was anything about me he didn't know, and uh, I mentioned that uh, I was abused. Now, you mentioned this in sort of an offhand way now. Was that a, a very big thing for you to reveal at the time? I had never told anybody that I was abused. Now, why were you telling Lyle, like Lyle Menendez at this time? Well, I felt really close to him, and then I felt like, you know, he showed an interest in me and wanted to know everything about me, and, and also I felt the time was right for me to tell someone. Okay. And how did you feel in talking about your own abuse? It wasn't easy. I didn't think it was going to be. And what did you tell him had happened to you? Um, Objection here, sir. It's not being offered for the truth of what is said, just to uh, reflect the conversation. You may proceed. <coughs> I can't remember word for word, but it was something along the lines that I was abused when I was very young, and that uh, it kind of. Mm -hmm changed the course of my life, kind of. Did you tell him who had abused you? I can't recall if I did or not. Who was it that had abused you? It's a friend of my father's. A male or a female? Male. And were you emotional in describing this to Lyle? The memory is somewhat blurred, but I do th remember, I think, leaving the table not being able to uh, control my emotions. And how did Lyle respond to this? Um, he was uh, he's pretty quiet, he's a great listener, and uh, anything pertaining to me or something of this, he was just was very quiet, gave me all the time I needed to answer the question, you know, to, and uh, seems somewhat uh, emotional about it. 
Why do you say he seemed emotional about it? I can't remember exactly why, but I just know that he reacted strongly towards me saying that. It wasn't, I would have remembered if he would have, like, changed the subject or, you know, mm -hmm. you know, looked like he was not believing me. Do you remember saying that he, that Lyle seemed very shaken? I don't remember saying that, but if I, that's, that's a pretty good response. <laughs> And do you remember saying that uh, tears were welling in his eyes, in yeah. Lyle's eyes? <laughs> Overall. Do you remember saying that tears were welling in Lyle's eyes? Um, yes, I do. Um, what did you think about the way he reacted to this information you were giving him? Um, well, that's it. That's a tough question because uh, we had known each other for so long and we both knew about each other's fathers and our both our fathers are very oppressive. And uh, since the very first night we met, we talked about how hard they were pushing us and, and how much of a driving force they were in our lives. And so at the time, maybe through some intuition, I might have thought that, you know, he was reacting either kindly to me because of my past or whether he was, you know, feeling the same way himself. Do you remember saying that you were shocked at how emotional he was? I don't remember saying that, but that sounds like something I would have said. Okay. Were you shocked at how emotional he was? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. You never know what to expect when you tell someone something like that. And did that cause you to believe that something similar may have happened <coughs> to Lyle? Absolutely. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. How, what did that cause you to believe? That he may have had similar experiences. Okay. And did he say anything to you about having had a similar experience? Not that I recall, no. Did he say anything to you about his father having molested both him and his brother? No, I would have remembered that. You would remember that if he did that? Oh, absolutely. Is that correct? Did you ever tell anyone else that Lyle had told you that he had been molested by his father and his brother had also? Um, obviously, I heard the tape, so I know that I may have mentioned it later on. Okay, and to whom did you mention it? Bob Rand. Do you remember when you testified in uh, July 26, on July 26, 1993, as a prosecution witness, um, you said that you had never told anybody uh, that Lyle Menendez had made this statement to you? Yes. Do you remember that? So I take it you were mistaken at that time. Is that correct? Obviously. Family. As far as I see it compared to our family, you know, 
my two greatest concerns are my mom and my brother, and uh, I try to help them as much as I can. I, I worry if anything happens to me, if they're going to be okay. He takes care of his brother. He just looks out for his brother. It's his biggest concern. And he said, uh, you know, if anything happens to me, uh, I need you to help take care of my brother for me. And uh, if anything happens you know, to you, I'll take care of your mom and brother for you. I mean, these kind of things are said back and forth across the table. And uh, I want to be, be together for him. anything to come between us, anybody, any girl, anything, just us. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, is there, is there anything I don't know about you? And I said, you know, as a matter of fact, there is. You know, when I was a kid, I was told I was molested. Mm-hmm. Uh, in front of my father's, we were spending the weekend at mm-hmm. a business friend's house. And telling the story, I'm all choked up because I can't believe I've never, I've never told anyone yeah, the story. Yeah, that was really personal. Yeah. And then, uh, and then that, you know, he was in tears. There's 20 minutes in speed. And I'm telling him this whole story. About, I can still remember, you know, the pictures on the wall and, color of the room and the carpet and the uh, time it was and you know everything about it it's very clear in my mind and just bringing it all back up and I have to choke that back excuse myself for the bath and wipe the tears up like this. He came back and he told me about his father and, and I I guess maybe one of the reasons we were friends is because we had so much in common with this yeah, way, the way we had suffered you know experience and then and then to, to bring this into the relationship as far as um, an experience we both shared that we'd never spoken to or about to anybody. So basically he said that his father had been abusing her. Yeah, him and her. Yeah, and her. And, uh, oh, a lot of love. Yeah, and uh, we take baths with him and stuff like that. I just, man, you're just... <laughs> You're at this, it's weird because you felt we were we weren't drinking, we were just sitting there eating and the whole place is closed, chairs are up on the table, you guys just didn't have to wait for us to leave and he's telling me this. I could have fallen on the back of my seat and he's telling me that. Um, him and his brother and uh, his brother has been the most affected by this still uh, he was younger, uh, more impressionable. It was uh, I don't know, I can't really go into it. Yes. And who's the other voice on the tape? Bob Rand. And was that an interview you had with him in March of 1992? I can't recall when I did the interview. You talked to Mr. Rand on several occasions, is that correct? Yes. And you were, were interviewed by several other reporters, is that correct? Yes. And having listened to the tape now, uh, does that refresh your recollection? Of the events? Yes. No, I heard the tape last time, and it doesn't help me. I know that I said that, but I just can't recall all the events surrounding it. Okay. Well, do you think when you told Mr. Rand that in March of 1992, you were telling him the truth? I, I really can't recall why I would have said that, whether it was truth or not. And you mean you might have just made that up? It's possible with knowing Glenn Stevens and uh, Bob Rand that I may have put that together. I'm not sure how I came to that. And conclusion. how is knowing Glenn Stevens and Bob Rand, um, how would that have created the situation? Well, unlike L.A., New York, something along the lines of this trial goes somewhat unnoticed. And uh, there was an anonymity there. And a lot of, I didn't know a lot about the trial, only what maybe Glenn Stevens, who I had contact with, and Bob Rand may have told me over a period of years. And now, do, is it your testimony that Bob Rand told you that Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father? Oh, no, I'm not saying that. I'm not sure where I heard it. Okay. I can't say who I heard it from. Is it your testimony that Glenn Stevens told you that Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father? It may have been him. It may have been Bob Rand. Do you remember uh, saying that you were very surprised when you met with Glenn Stevens after this interview with Bob Rand and he seemed to know about Lyle and Eric having been molested? 
Objection, a since fact, not evidence. No. Like a foundation. Let me go back, if I may, Your Honor. Right. Um, you were interviewed by reporters for the Los Angeles Times Magazine at one point. Is that correct? Yes. And you then went to Princeton to have your picture taken there as part of the article that they were publishing with regard to this case. Is that correct? Yes. And when you went to Princeton to be photographed, you ran into Glenn Stevens. Is that correct? Yes. And do you remember telling Bob Rand that you were so surprised when you ran into Glenn Stevens because he also seemed to know that Lyle and Eric had been molested? I don't remember saying that. I remember talking to him and I don't remember anything about that. If I showed you a transcript of that part of the tape with Bob Rand, would that refresh your recollection? No. No, because this obviously didn't, so I can't say that that would. All right. So if you had told Bob Rand that that this was the first time that you'd seen Glenn since you were thrown out of uh, the dorm room in Princeton and that you were so surprised because Glenn said, did you know about the molestation? And you told Bob Rand that you were surprised that Glenn also knew. Objection. Do you remember saying something like that to Bob Rand? Objection calls for hearsay lack of foundation. No, I'm just asking if he remembers saying that. Objection sustained the do you remember telling Bob Rand <coughs> that when Glenn Stevens told you he knew about the molestation, you were surprised because you already knew it? No. No, I don't. Your Honor, if I could have a minute, I have the remainder of the tape, and I can play that part for Mr. Woodrow. Mr. Goudreau, rather than take the time to find on the tape this particular section, I'm going to read you a transcript of what's on the tape and see if you remember saying that. And I believe it would be a stipulation that this is a transcript of the tape, although it may not be 100% accurate. We're going to admit the tape. Is that correct? Yes, there would be a stipulation that this is a somewhat accurate transcript. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Goudreau, on the tape, it says basically this. The first time I'd seen Glenn, and you're referring to this incident where you had your photograph taken. Do you remember that? Yes. It said, we were walking over in front of Chuck's, and he all of a sudden was walking out of Chuck's. All of a sudden walking out of Chuck's was Glenn and this girl. And he looks up, and he goes, hey, hey. Do you remember that happening? I don't remember what he said, but I remember seeing him walking out of Chuck's. Okay. But of course, there was a smile on his face, and he was immediately elated. We shook hands, and this photographer got a picture of us together. Is that correct? Did that happen? I don't remember shaking hands. I do mean, remember him being happy to see me. Okay. And do you remember being photographed? Um, I remember the photograph, but I don't remember the picture actually being taken. Okay. Then you say it was the picture in the Los Angeles Time magazine. Is that the photograph you're referring to? Yes. And we were in there, and the guy wanted to go. So I told him I would just take the train back to town. Did you take the train back to town? I must have. Okay. <coughs> and when the photographer, and then there's a part of the tape we can't hear, then the sentence goes on, Glenn and myself stayed there. Did you stay and talk to Glenn after your photo was taken? Yes, I did. And Glenn just freaked me out because I thought Lyle, I thought I was the only one who'd heard about that or knew about that. And all of a sudden, Glenn told me the same thing. He said, did you know about the molestation and all that? Do you remember that? No. You remember telling Mr. Rand that? Not, not clearly, no. Okay. But if your voice is on the tape, Obviously, sure. then it would have been something you said, is that correct? Sure. And he brought it up again, and I'd almost forgotten about it, and he brought it up again, and I just couldn't believe it. I said, really? I said, I didn't know about that, and it was kind of strange for him to tell me 
because I was wondering under what circumstances he would tell Glenn. Now, that's referring to Lyle telling Glenn, is that correct? Yes. Did it seem surprising to you that Glenn would have been told by Lyle? There's been speculation and irrelevant. Sustained. Did you think that the relationship that Lyle had with you was much closer than the relationship he had with Glenn? Direction irrelevant. Overall. I wasn't sure because I hadn't seen either one of them in a long time. But at the time that you were all at Princeton together, was your relationship with Lyle much closer than oh, Lyle's with Glenn? And then the tape goes on to say, and you know, I thought he was having problems, you know, Lyle was scared too. The house at Calabasas had this huge bathtub and he was like fearing this thing. Do you remember saying anything about a bathtub? No. But if your voice is on the tape, you would have been the one to say it, is that correct? Yes. To like God's end, they didn't like the house at all, yeah. So I remember Glenn told me that later, that kind of brought it back up that made me think about the whole hatred thing and about how he hated his father. And he told me, and then Mr. Rand's voice comes on and says he would go on and on about how much he respected his father. And the tape goes on from there. Do you remember having that conversation with Mr. Rand? No. What is your... What is your position with regard to where you got the information about Lyle and Eric having been molested by their father? Do you know where that information came from? After uh, I testified last time, I thought a lot about it, and the only people I was in contact with were Bob Rand and Glenn Stevens. And yet, this part of the tape seems to indicate that you already knew about it, about the molestation when Glenn revealed it. Is that correct? Yes, it, it sounds that way. Okay. So if you already knew about it when Glenn brought it up, then Glenn would not have been the source of the information. Is that correct? I have no idea. Overall, the answer is dead. And do you, is it, what's your testimony with regard to Mr. Rand? Did he tell you? Tell me. That Lyle and Eric had been molested by their father, or did you tell him? I have no idea. Well, when you listen... Obviously, I told him, but it seems like there was a couple places where he seemed to be leading me, and I'm unclear about whether I might have come under that assumption myself or been... Well, when you say there's a couple places where he seems to be leading you, um, he says to you at the beginning of the tape, we didn't mention yesterday, you got off on, and then there's a part of the tape again here, where he had at one point mentioned that Eric was being abused sexually. And you said, yeah, I don't want to go off into that. I know I'm scared it's going to come up at trial. And Mr. Rand says, well, how did that conversation start? And then you proceed to tell the entire story of the Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And during the time you're telling that story, Mr. Rand is not supplying you any information. Is that correct? Um, can you repeat the question? Yes. During the time that you are telling Mr. Rand the story mm -hmm. of your conversation in the Chinese restaurant, it's just you talking. Isn't that correct? No, I'm, I'm aware of that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And at the end, Mr. Rand says, so basically his father had been Mo, and that's the end of that, and you interrupt and you say yes. Mr. Rand says, abusing Eric, and you say, yeah, him and Eric. And Mr. Rand says, both Lyle also? And you say, yes. Is that correct? Yes. So are you suggesting that Mr. Rand gave you this information? I already answered that earlier. I have no idea where I may have come up with that. So you're not saying Mr. Rand gave you that information? I'm not sure if he did or not. And you're not saying Glenn Stevens gave you that information? He may have also, I'm not sure. But then how would you have said that you were surprised that Glenn knew it when you already knew it? If the information came from Glenn? I don't remember saying I was surprised. 
I know you read the transcript, and I did remember, I do remember hearing that, mm -hmm. but I still can't remember. So if your voice is on the tape saying that, though, that would have been something you said. Yes. Do you have any other sources, possible sources, for where that information would have come from? In New York City, the, the media didn't really cover the trial mm -hmm. or any aspects of it. Uh, do you remember testifying, and Your Honor, at this time I'm reading from volume 55, July 27, 1993, page 7994, starting at line 9. Question is, the other thing you said was you got information about the case from Mr. Rand and Mr. Stevens. Answer, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're the only two people I had contact with. Question, and did you ever have any conversations with Mr. Stevens about whether Lyle or Eric abused their parents? Your answer was, were abused by their parents. <coughs> Your answer was no. And then my question was, so the information couldn't have come from Mr. Stevens, is that correct? Your answer was, I'm not saying, I don't know where the information came from. I obviously said it. And then there is, then you are asked on page 7995, question, and do you remember have any, having any conversations with him, meaning Mr. Stevens, with regard to whether there was any sexual abuse in the family? You answered no. Is that correct? What page counsel? I'm sorry. That was 7995, line 17. Could you repeat that question? Yes. You were asked, do you remember having any conversations with him, meaning Mr. Stevens, on that occasion, which was the time you had the picture taken, with regard to whether there was any sexual abuse in the family? Your answer was no, you didn't remember any such conversation. Do you remember testifying to that under oath? Yes. And yet your voice is on the tape indicating you had such a conversation, is that correct? Yes, it is. And then later on, page 7996 at line 27, I asked you, and at that time, that at the time that you and Mr. Stevens were photographed together, did you have any conversation at that time as to whether Lyle and Eric, whether, I'm sorry, whether Lyle had ever revealed to either of you anything about the abuse in his family, the sexual abuse of either him or of Eric? And you then say, I can't remember if we did or not. So is it fair to say that you don't remember? Yes. But you do remember for sure the conversation in the Chinese restaurant. Is that correct? Um, parts of it, yes. And you do remember for sure that you revealed your own abuse? Yes. And you do remember for sure Lyle's very strong emotional reaction to that? Yes. And you do remember for sure that you assumed, based on his reaction, that the same thing had happened to him? Yes. You just are not sure about the words? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any examination on behalf of Eric Menendez? No, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Mr. Goodrow, do you know on how many occasions you spoke to Mr. Rand in person? Several. And do you know uh, in which year was the first time that you spoke to Mr. Rand? Oh, it had to be uh, probably within months of the arrest, so spring, early summer, 90. And what was your understanding as to um, the purpose that, well, why were you providing information to Mr. Rand? He was a reporter. He was asking me questions. So the first time in your memory that you spoke to Mr. Rand would have been within a few months of the arrest of the Menendez brothers. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. 
And I believe um, that the um, foundation for the tape that we've heard in court, Exhibit 293, is that that was made sometime in the spring of 1992. Is that your understanding of when that tape recording was made? Yes. Um, to your knowledge, um, first of all, when you made the tape recording with Mr. Rand, was there a day of interviews which preceded the day that was taped? Yes. And the day that of interviews which came before the taped interview, that day was not taped. Is that correct? I don't remember. I do remember it was a two-day process. I'm not sure which day was the recording was on. And do you recall actually seeing or being aware of a tape recorder during one or both of those days that you spoke to Mr. Rand? Yes. Okay, so you were aware of the fact that you were being taped? Yes. Okay, and between um, 1990, at the first time you spoke to Mr. Rand in person, and early 1992 when the tape was made, do you know on how many other occasions you spoke to Mr. Rand? in person? Again, maybe 10 on the phone. So you would have spoken to him about 10 times on the phone? Yes. Um, and so the only two face-to-face -face meetings you had with him then were the one in 1990 and the one in 1992? No, I'm sure there was one or two other ones. I just can't remember time or place. Now the 10 or so phone calls that you had um, during the first and then this tape recorded meeting, uh, were those for the purpose of getting information from you? Yes. And um, during the course of time that you knew Mr. Rand, did Mr. Rand ever give you any information about the Menendez case? All the time. And was that something that happened fairly frequently, or was that something that happened only on occasion? Pretty much every phone call or every meeting. Right. And um, now I believe then the indication is, is that in early or sometime in 1992 when this tape was made, that was when the subject of the... Um, molestation was discussed between yourself and Mr. Rand, is that correct? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? It was the first time that you discussed the um, subject of molestation during the meeting that's taped? I have no idea. All right, yeah, but prior to that time you had been receiving information from Mr. Rand, is that correct? Yes. I believe you indicated at some point um, you went to the Princeton area to have your photograph taken for another article which was being prepared by reporters from the Los Angeles Times, is that correct? Yes. And during that period of time you actually spoke with Mr. Stevens, correct? Yes, I did. And was that the first time I, I think you testified that you'd seen Mr. Stevens since you had been ejected from Lyle Menendez's room at Princeton in the spring of 1990, uh, 1989? Yes. Do you remember in which month in year it was that you had your picture taken at Princeton? No. Do you remember what year it was? I have no idea. Okay. Was it at, had you already met Mr. Rand at the time that you interviewed with the reporters from the Los Angeles Times? Yes, because I remember seeing Mr. Rand before I went to Princeton area. Yeah, I guess that'd be the order. Were you ever aware of an article, either by reading it or by having someone tell you about it, that appeared in Vanity Fair magazine in October of 1990. Oh, yes. All right, now how was it that you were aware of the Vanity Fair article? Well, I think, I remember a friend of mine may have mentioned it, and I went and purchased it and read it. So you actually read the Vanity Fair article? Yes. Okay. And do you remember mention in the Vanity Fair article dealing with the subject matter of sex within the Menendez family? I don't remember in the initial reading, but I do remember someone referring to it as the first time that molestation had been talked about. Okay. And do you recall that you were able to buy the Vanity Fair article on the newsstands, or um, had the article already appeared and been taken off the newsstands at the, t at the time that you read it? In other words, did you read it in October of 1990? I'm sure I read it shortly after, within weeks of it coming out. Okay. Now. Um, I believe you've indicated that you have no present recollection of Lyle Menendez telling you in um, the restaurant, the Chinese restaurant in Princeton, um, that he and his brother had been molested by their father. Is that correct? Yes. Um, do you remember testifying uh, previously that that was the kind of information you think you would have recalled? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And is that still your position here today, that if he had told you that, that you think you would have remembered it? Yes, it is. Um, in addition to reading the Vanity Fair article, 
um, and speaking to Mr. Rand, did you also, do you have any recollection now of getting inf any other information about the Menendez case from any other source between the time of the arrests and the time that you made the tape with Mr. Rand? Not that I remember. Now, did, um, during the time that you were acquainted with Lyle Menendez, that would, be, would have been from February of 89 until May of 89, uh, did Mr. Lyle Menendez ever mention anything to you about a bathtub being constructed in the Calabasas home? Not that I remember. When you were here visiting for the week that he flew you out, did you ever go visit the construction site of the Calabasas home? Um, no. Okay, may I have a moment, please, Your Honor? I'm going to be referring up to the transcript, volume 55, July 27th, 1993, starting at page 7988. Mr. Goudreau, do you remember having a hearing outside the presence of the jury where we asked you questions in July about the subject matter? No. I don't remember exactly. I don't remember that, do you, whether the jury was here or not. Okay. Do you remember being questioned about this, though, in July of this year? Sure. Do you remember being asked the following question and giving the following answer at lines three through six? Now, Mr. Goodroll, did Lyle Menendez ever tell you that he had been sexually abused by either of his parents? And your answer was no, never. Did you give that testimony? Do you recall giving it? Yes, I did. Okay. And is it still your position today that you have no memory of him telling you that? Yes, it is. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Goodroll, when you were living at um, Princeton, you you told some stories about yourself that were untrue, is that correct? Yes. And I believe that in the transcript, which was prepared as a result of this tape, Exhibit 293, you talked about the fact that Lyle Menendez had found out about your lies, and you referred to them as lies, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe you indicated on direct examination um, that you had a reaction in the Chinese restaurant to the way that Lyle Menendez reacted to your news of your having been molested. Do you understand my question? I reacted to the way he was reacting? Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. And do you have a memory sitting here today of how you reacted or how you felt after seeing Lyle Menendez's reaction to your news? Um, not exactly, but I do remember leaving the table and I think I was somewhat emotional. Okay, and, and was your emotion caused by the news that you had told to Lyle Menendez, or was it caused by the fact of how he had reacted to your news, or both? Probably the news that I had told. All right. And... I'm going to object and move to strike the speculation. Sustain the answer struck. Do you remember testifying in July, of, um, on July the 27th, council line, uh, page 7990, um, lines 5 through nine. Question, okay, what did you think when Lyle Menendez reacted the way he did to what you told him? Answer, I was shocked. He was quite emotional when I told him what had happened. Do you remember testifying to that? Yes. Is that testimony accurate as to how things happened that night in the Chinese restaurant? Absolutely. <coughs> now, from how he reacted, did you in your own mind make any deductions about what his reaction meant? Uh, Yes. And what did you, in your own mind, deduce at that time? Um, that maybe the same thing had happened to him. And do you have a specific memory sitting here today of thinking that in the Chinese restaurant? In other words, do you remember that when you were in the Chinese restaurant, you thought, boy, maybe something happened to him by the way he's reacting? I can't say how specific it was, but somewhere along the lines, I do remember feeling that way. And then after um, you had this conversation in the Chinese restaurant and after Lyle Menendez was arrested, um, you were interviewed by Mr. Rand some few months after the arrest in 1990, correct? Yes. And then sometime around October of 1990, you um, read the Vanity Fair article in which there were allusions made to um, possible s sex within the family. Do you recall? When did the article come out? In October of 1990. Yes, I did. Okay. And then um, I believe you indicated that you did go to Princeton to have your picture taken, and you spoke with Glenn Stevens at that time. Is that correct? Yes. And um, I take it then, it's your testimony you have no recollection sitting here today of what you, Mr. Stevens, talked about 
during that picture taking session in Princeton. Is that correct? Not, I remember bits and pieces, but nothing substantial. Um, and then um, it wasn't until 1992 that you and Mr. Rand actually discussed the subject matter which is contained with that, the tape of Exhibit 293. Is that correct? If the tape was done in... Yeah, you're right. Now, during the course of your friendship with Lyle Menendez, did he in fact ever tell you that he hated his father? Hated his father? He might not use such strong words, but there was definitely some dislike for some things his father had done. All right, I believe that in the second um, portion of the tape that was actually read to you by Ms. Lansing, there was reference in there to Lyle hating his father. That's something that you told to Mr. Rand. Do you remember telling Mr. Rand that? No. Okay, would it have been accurate for you to have told Mr. Rand that Lyle Menendez hated his father? I would have probably summed it all up and just said he hated his father, but that would have been correct. I believe um, you were asked some questions at page 7995 of volume 55. Um, question at line 26. Question, it could, have come, it could have come from Mr. Stevens, meaning information. Your answer was, yes, it could have. I don't remember hearing it or where I heard it from is what I'm saying. And then the uh, next question was, but the only places it could have come from, I think you said, were either Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Your answer was quite possibly yes. Next question. Or from Lyle Menendez. Answer. I don't think he ever mentioned anything about his father abusing him. Question. That you remember or you're not sure? Your answer was, I'm pretty sure he never did. Do you recall giving that testimony in court in July of 1993? Yes. And you indicated there that the, um, that the only source of the information could have been Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Do you remember? I just read that part to you. Yeah, possibly. And in addition I'm to... I'm going to object to misstating the evidence that the only sources could have been... Rephrase the question, please. I believe the question asked of you by Ms. Lansing was, but the only places it could have come from, I think you said, were either Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand. Your answer, quite possibly yes. Do you remember giving that testimony? Yes. And in addition to Mr. Stevens or Mr. Rand, you also had information from the Vanity Fair article. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Goudreau, you also had information from Lyle Menendez. Is that correct? About? Well, you were at, asked if you had information from Mr. Rand and Mr. Stevens in the Vanity Fair article. Is that correct? Did I you have information from Mr. Stevens? I'm not sure. Did you have information from Mr. Rand? I'm not sure if it was... Did you have information from Mr. Menendez? I don't think so. But you're not sure? Not sure. Um, Mrs. Bazanich asked you about the comment about whether Lyle hated his father, and you said that that would, that would have been a short way to explain it. Can you tell me what you meant by that? Well, he, he would have expressed it differently. He wouldn't have just come out and said, I hated my father. He would have mentioned something specific, maybe mentioned that he disliked how his father had handled something, and he wouldn't have come out and said, I hated my father. Did he love his father? Yes. Did he respect his father? Yes. Did he, was he very troubled by the way his father had treated his mother with regard to an affair? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. And the people are represented, and the jury is in the jury box. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm sorry for the delay, but there were some matters that required the attorneys and I to discuss some um, in more detail than I had anticipated, but we're now finished with that, and we're now ready to proceed with the uh, testimony. Um, before I do that, let me ask the uh, jurors here uh, in the Eric Menendez uh, jury uh, whether or not any of you have seen or read or heard of anything about this case in the news media or anywhere else since the trial started. Anybody? Okay. All right, then the people may call their next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. People call Craig Signorelli. Mm -hmm. 
C-I-G-N-A-R-E-L-L-I. All right, just uh, sit back and relax. And uh, perhaps we can have the microphone adjusted a little bit for him. You need that. Okay. All right, we'll just hold it. Okay. We're ready to proceed. Uh, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Signorelli, do you know the defendant in this case, Eric Menendez? Yes. And when did you first meet him? My junior year in high school, his sophomore year, which was 1987. And what were the circumstances of your meeting him? We were, uh, he came to the school and uh, he was a tennis player and I found out he was a tennis player and knew he was going to be on the team. And uh, just, I walked up and met him and uh, we became buddies almost instantly. Were you also a tennis player? Yes. Were you the captain of the team? Yes. And what year was that? 1988. So you struck up a friendship with uh, Eric Menendez? Correct. What cer sorts of activities would you uh, do with uh, Eric Menendez besides the actual tennis practices? Uh, we'd go to tournaments together. Um, we'd go up in the hills and talk about Um, talk about dreams for the future, um, plans for business opportunities and um, girls, everything. When you say you, you go up to the hills, what, what do you mean by that? Where, where we used to that? drive up into the hills, um, a, a place we used to have which looked over the ocean and the valleys and um, just kind of get away from everything that was happening in society and try to dream of a better ideology for the future. Where, where was this location? Up uh, off Mulholland, up in the hills. Do you, can you be a little bit more specific as to where this? Um, up Stunt Road and uh, a dirt hill about 150 paces off the road. How often would you go with uh, Eric Menendez to this uh, location? I don't know, several times during the years we knew each other, probably 10 times, 15 times. You indicated that you uh, discussed uh, business aspirations? Correct. What sorts of aspirations did uh, Eric Menendez uh, relate to you? Well, we wanted to um, start a company which had, it was multifaceted and dealt in inventions and screenwriting and um, <laughs> I hate to use the analogy, but similar to a billionaire boys club type thing with um, Your Honor, I would everything. Your I to move to strike. It has to approach. The objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. The entire answer is stricken, and the jury is advised to disregard it, which means you should uh, not pay any attention to the answer and uh, disregard it. And um, you may re-ask the question and the question is denied. Without giving this... Uh, business a name what sort of business was it um multifaceted corporation in dealing in what just about everything i'm a um I'm in stocks inventions screenplays uh corporate takeovers just anything we could do um to to develop our status in society would you, um, would you say that you had a very close relationship, friendship with Eric Menendez? Yeah, we were best friends for two and a half years. From 1987 to 1989? Correct. Well, yeah. At some point, uh, Eric Menendez uh, moved to Beverly Hills, correct? correct? Yeah. And at that point, when, when Eric Menendez moved to Beverly Hills, where were you staying? I was in Santa Barbara going to school. At UC Santa Barbara? UC Santa Barbara, yes. So you indicated that you're a year older than Correct. Eric Menendez. Uh, did you see Eric Menendez at the Beverly Hills house? Yes, I went down there a couple times. Was, uh, were you, did you have any information about uh, Eric's plans to be an actor? 
Um, yeah, well, we used to write the screenplays uh, with the intent of him becoming an actor. And uh, he said he won best actor in drama at his yeah, high school. Objection is sustained. Uh, after yes, everything else in the answer is stricken as non-responsive. Okay. Did he indicate to you that he had taken a class at Beverly Hills High School? Yes. And did he indicate anything further to you about his uh, acting uh, aspirations? Your Honor, I would object this whole line of testimony. Uh, objection overruled, but can we go back to what class it is that you're referring to, Mr. Kuriyama? Okay. What class did uh, Eric Menendez indicate to you that he took at Beverly Hills High School? Well, several, but a drama class, I believe, is With what you're looking for. With respect to the uh, drama class, did he indicate to you that he had won an award for acting? He said he won the Best Acting Award in Drama. At some point in August of 1989, did you become aware of the uh, deaths of Jose and Mary Menendez? Yes. And how did you become aware of, of uh, the deaths? I got a phone call from a uh, one of my old tennis coaches. He called me in the morning and asked if. Um, All right, the objection is sustained, but the answer will stand. He has answered the question, and you may ask your next question. Thank you, Your Honor. After learning of the deaths of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez, uh, did you take any steps to contact Eric Menendez? Yes. What did you do? Called him that day. <laughs> And did you actually talk to Eric Menendez? No, I got the answering machine. Did you at some point thereafter have phone contact with Eric Menendez? Uh, he had a friend call me back. And then I spoke with him. <laughs> he had a friend call me back. Okay, and after this friend called you back, did you have a phone conversation with Eric Menendez? Um, I don't believe so. Sometime later, did you have a phone conversation with uh, Eric Menendez? I don't recall. Did you at some point uh, actually meet with Eric Menendez sometime shortly after the, uh, the deaths of his parents? Yes. Overall. Overall. Yes, about a week after, a week and a half after. And would you describe for the jurors uh, what took place? Did you actually go to his house? I went down to the Beverly Hills house and, and was there as a best friend just to kind of hang out with him, make sure everything was okay. Objection, that was Overall, the answer will stand. Now, when you went to uh, the Menendez home in Beverly Hills, uh, who was there when you arrived? When I arrived, uh, Eric and several security guards. Do you recall how many security guards there were? No, several. <laughs> were they carrying guns? Objection, your own relevance. Overruled. I believe so, yes. Do you recall what day of the week uh, it was that you uh, went to see Eric Menendez at, shortly after the, the killings? Uh, I think it was a Friday. Do you recall anything uh, noteworthy that occurred on the, that first day that you were there? Um, were there any visitors to the Menendez house when you were there? Yeah, there was a somebody who came to look at the computer um, upstairs. Do you recall, was it a, a male or a female? It was a male with a uh, pregnant wife. Did uh, you and, or did Eric uh, talk to this person, this computer person? Yes, we both did. Now, at some point, did the uh, uh, person actually go to a computer? Yeah, he went to the computer in the um, parents' bedroom. Did, what did you and Eric do at that time? We were with him. Went upstairs as well? Yes. Upstairs, was there a uh, conversation? Uh, between yourself and Eric Menendez? A little bit, yes. Do uh, you recall what was being discussed? We were talking about uh, a will that the computer guy was looking for. Uh, Eric Menendez told you that? Yes. Did he say anything else about uh, a will? 
he said that um, his brother had had someone come up and erase uh, a family will, or had a computer expert come up and erase the family will, and that he knew that um, if it's not professionally done, that you, there's still access inside the computer, and that's why he was having this guy come up well. and try to find it. Did you know that it was uh, Carlos Menendez, um, a relative, who hired that particular uh, computer expert? No. Objection is sustained as to the form of the questions under who you're referring to and the answer is second. Okay. Mr. Signorelli, did you actually know who had hired this particular expert that you saw that day? That day? Yes. Did, do you know? Eric said that he had somebody come up. I don't know for sure who hired him, no. Now, during the, the course of this expert um, accessing the computer, what other conversation took place between you and Eric Menendez? Um, he explained that the will, um, the original will that this expert was looking for was supposed to be the one that um, his father was retyping. Um, it's the old will, he said, left the, all the money to the kids and that this new will that he had thought Lyle had erased was supposed to leave some money to the company, some money to the kids, and some money to somewhere else. I don't remember who. Did he express an interest in seeing whether or not it was still on the computer? Yes. Will? Do you remember approximately how long it was that the uh, computer expert and his pregnant wife were there? A couple hours, probably. Now, this day that the computer expert came, uh, was that the first day that you had been with Eric Menendez? Right, correct. After the, the killings? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened after the, yes, the computer expert left? What did you and Eric do? Just hung out at the house. Um, I don't know if it was that day or the next day that we went out to lunch. Okay. It's, uh, did you actually spend the night at uh, Eric Menendez's house? Yeah. Yes. Did you spend the entire weekend over there? I don't recall if I spent. I, I know I spent one night. Um, I don't remember in the second one. Okay, so would that have been a Friday night that you spent there? Correct. Into the next day, the Saturday following? Right. At some point during your uh, visit with Eric Menendez, uh, did he ever talk about the killings? Yes. Would you describe for the jurors what he told you and what the circumstances were, where you were? We were walking. Um, <clears throat> do you have a diagram? Uh, we, were, we were in the foyer. Uh. And this is exhibit six, is that right? Sir, you really direct your attention to Exhibit 6. Do you recognize what's depicted in that uh, diagram, sir? Yes, the bottom level. <laughs> Menendez House. And you've been over to that house? Yes. Would you describe where you were uh, when Eric Menendez explained to you what happened? Yes. I pointed. Okay. It's in between the entryway and the family room. Of the foyer, I used to call it. Yes. Was there anyone else there? No. Well, the security guards may have been there, outside. Yes, but not we're not in the present area. What, what did he tell you? That? <laughs> he said, "Do you want to know how it happened?" And I said, "Yes," and I wasn't really sure where we're going with it. And can I do I have to talk into the mic? It'd be better if you did. All right. Um, does it come out? 
Um, he said that um, he was coming home from. <laughs> he was coming home. Just tell us what was said. He said he was coming home from um, a movie and that he was going inside to get his ID, a fake ID, to go out to the bars. And um, he said he went inside and he yeah, came I back. Would object to the witness using the Objection sustained. You don't have to tell us what was shown to you on a diagram, just tell us what was said, okay? All right. He said that um, he went back outside and his brother was standing there with two shotguns and said, let's do it. And they walked inside and Lyle was standing, or Eric went up to the door on the left, which was slightly open, and the door on the right, Lyle went up and put his shoulder against the door on the right, and Eric said he looked in and saw his parents sitting on the couch, and Lyle swung the door open and shot his father and looked at Eric and said, shoot mom. And Eric said he shot his mom as she was standing up and yelling. Was he, what was he doing at this point? Was he emotional at this point or was it matter of fact? Could you describe for the jurors how he related this story? Just probably a little less nervous than I just did. Just, I mean, casual and kind of a low tone of voice. Just in like conversation tone. Did he at that point tell you that they were shotguns or did he just say guns? Just guns. Did he indicate to you where Lyle was with these guns? Outside. So it's your understanding that they came from the outside and came back inside and then entered the family room? Correct. What else did he tell you about this, uh, what happened that night? That was it. We just went on with conversation after that. What other topics did you discuss that night? I don't really remember. I think we played a game of chess after that sometime. And uh, we had dinner. Someone brought over dinner. And I don't, just, I, I don't remember, really. Did Eric Menendez ever tell you that he acted in self-defense? Yeah. No. Objection overruled. The answer will stand. Did he ever tell you that he was being abused by his parents? No. Sometime after this, uh, this night, or this weekend, uh, did you have further conversations with Eric Menendez? Yes. And in those uh, further conversations after this one, did he indicate to you anything that was inconsistent with his statement to you that he and Lyle killed their parents. No, I'm going to object to the question. Objection sustained. 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 Objection sust
You know, did you give uh, Detective Zoller certain information that you had received from Eric Menendez? Yes. Did you, um, prior to the November 29th, 1989 conversation, uh, make arrangements with the Beverly Hills Police Department to wear a body wire at a uh, meeting that you would have with Eric Menendez? Yes. And did you, in fact, wear a body wire for the conversation which took place on November 29th, 1989 at Gladstone's restaurant in, in yes. Malibu? <laughs> Mr. Signorelli, on the date that the computer expert came uh, with his pregnant wife and he had a conversation with Eric Menendez, did Eric Menendez indicate to you when it was that Lyle Menendez had someone erase uh, the computer? He indicated, but I don't remember. In which high school was it that you uh, met Eric Menendez? At Calabasas High School. And this location that you and uh, Eric Menendez would go to uh, to talk about things, where, what city was that in? <laughs> I think Calabasas. Up in, it's up in the hills. Um, what's now Calabasas? Thank you. I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Signorelli, you're a student now at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Correct. And uh, you began your studies there, I take it, in the fall of uh, 1988. Correct. You were a year ahead of Eric at Calabasas High School. Correct. Now, when Eric, uh, do you recall what month it was and what year it was when you first met Eric at Calabasas? No, I remember it was his sophomore year, my junior year. Okay. And the school year begins, does it not, in September? Correct. Do you think you met him in that early, the fall semester of your junior year? I don't recall, actually. When does the tennis team start practicing at Calabasas? What time of year? February. And therefore, if someone new was coming to the school who was qualified to be on the team, would he actually get to meet the team members in practice before February, or is February when it would begin? Well, on February is when the actual tennis team begins, but you can meet people beforehand at the tennis club or um, just playing on practice courts outside. Now, when you say the tennis club, is that the school's tennis club, or is that a private tennis club in the neighborhood? Private tennis club in the neighborhood. And was there a particular tennis club that both you and Eric uh, went to and played at? Yes, Calabasas. Okay, now you tend to talk very fast, so try to slow down. Calabasas Tennis Club, right? Yes. And was that a place where a number of the members of the Calabasas High School tennis team played after school? Yes. And do you think it's there or at school that you first met Eric? I believe it was at school. And when you first met him, um, I believe you said you, you heard that he was a tennis player and that he was likely to be on the team? Yes. Are the members of the team ranked? Like, is there a number one player, a number two player, etc.? Yes. At the time when you first met Eric, before he actually played on the team, what was your ranking? I was, I think, number one doubles. They rank him in singles and doubles, and then the order rotates depending on how the other schools um, rank their players. Okay. Were you ever number one singles? I don't believe so. I what? might have played a few matches at that, but I, I don't believe so. Was Eric ever number one singles? After he went to join the team, yeah. Was he always number... After he joined the team, yes. Was he always number one singles after he joined the team for as long as he was at Calabasas? No. Was there a time when he injured his foot and couldn't play for the team? I believe so, yes. And of course, if you can't play, you can't be number one singles, I take it. Correct. You can still hold the ranking, but you can't play the position. Right.
So you would see Eric um, at the tennis club and at school, I take it, and then the two of you would do things apart from those activities together. Correct. Were you in any classes with Eric? No, he was a junior, I was a senior. Or a sophomore and junior, we were a year apart. And did you um, receive tennis coaching outside of school? Um, not on a consistent basis. Were you familiar with the coaches at the Calabasas Jeff Tennis Club? Yes. Do you know a, a coach uh, from there named Doug Doss? Yes. And did Eric appear to know Doug Doss? Yes. I think you indicated that you went to tennis tournaments um, with Eric. Was that team tournaments? No, well, yes, team tournaments and regular um, USTA tournaments, which are just uh, for California rankings. Okay, let's define a few things. Um, USTA is the United States Tennis Association? Correct. And um, certain players, without getting into the details, uh, whether they play on school teams or not, can compete in USTA sponsored tennis tournaments all over the country. Correct. And uh, Eric played in tournaments in California, USTA tournaments in California. That's right. Did you? Yes. Now, did you ever observe Eric's parents at any of the tennis tournaments? Yes. Did you ever observe his father screaming on the tennis court? You mean at the tournaments, on the court, or just from well, the sidelines? Well, let's break it down. First of all, did you ever see his father um, emotional or screaming at the tournaments? Not screaming, but saying you need to do better. Being critical of Eric? Yes. And did you see his father um, on tennis courts, not part of tournaments, when Eric was playing? Yes. And did you ever see him screaming on those occasions? Not screaming, no. What would you see? Just criticizing and, and pushing him to do better, like most parents. So your experience is most parents criticize and push their kids to do better, is that what you're saying? Most parents push their kids to do better, yes. Do most parents criticize in front of other people? Around Calabasas, yes. <laughs> Tough parents hmm. in Calabasas. Right, council, let's do it through Did you, um, just a moment were there other friends that were on the tennis team that were mutual friends of yours and Eric's yes and it was one of those people, a young man named Stephen Einbinder? Yes. Who were the others? Um, John List, Mark Lipsky, and Jason Kikigawa, um, Steve Davis, Jason Nettleman. Now, were you friends, apart from being tennis uh, co-teammates with these uh, young men, were you friends with any of them, any special friend with any of them? Sure, yes. And uh, who among them were your special friends? <laughs> all of them? All of them, yeah. I mean, we all went out to dinner all the time, and just as a team. Now, when you first met Eric, um, you think it might have been 87, the fall, the spring semester? rather than 86, the fall semester? It might have been, yeah. Okay. When you first met him, uh, did he have a girlfriend? Not that I remember, no. Did he ultimately have a, a girlfriend named, a girl named Kirsten? Yes. And was she a tennis player also? Yes, at Thousand Oaks. Not at Calabasas High School? No. But she was at the tennis club, wasn't she? That's correct, yeah. You said that you and Eric went to tournaments together. Did you travel together or did you just wind up at the same tournaments? <laughs> we wound up at the same tournaments and we probably went to a couple together traveling together. Did your family travel with you to tournaments? 
and my mom did once in a while. Did Eric's family travel with him? Um, I think once in a while. About the same? I don't know. I, I went to play. Okay, so you weren't noticing whose parents were there or no, whose family members? No, not really, no. Now you said you and Eric also spent some time in, during the course of your friendship dreaming of the future. Correct. What did you want to do with your future? I still have intentions of uh, embarking. Uh, no, I want you to understand the question. I'm not asking you now. I'm saying going back in time then to 87, 88 when you knew Eric, uh, what were your dreams then for the future? Like I said, I still have intentions of embarking upon a political career. Um, back then it was also having a side hobby, writing uh, law screenplays and uh, definitely going to law school and hopefully practicing for a couple years before politics. So your ambitions then, which are quite lofty, are your ambitions now? That's correct. In fact, I think it's your goal to be in the U.S. Senate. Isn't That's it? correct. Um, you are, however, majoring at the moment in film, are you not? Not at the moment. I've completed my film major. So you, you have been a film major at UC Santa Barbara mm -hmm. for, what, four years now? Well, I mean, I've been in school. I'm going into my sixth year now because I took some time off. Okay. But uh, I did my film major for my political commercials. And was it, uh, or is it your intention to uh, act in those political commercials? <laughs> what do you mean act? I mean... The Appear in them yourself. Uh, uh, definitely. Did you take any drama classes when you were in high school? No. As part of your film major, did you take any classes in uh, screenwriting or creative writing? Um, I've taken, or I started taking a screenwriting class as an independent study project. Um, but I stopped when I had to drop out of school. Um, but most of it is done on the side with friends and just, um, you know, creating until I get out of school and get through my law school and then I'd like to really learn how it's done. Now you also told us that one of the things that you and Eric talked about by way of dreams of the future was a multi-dimensional company that did a lot of different things. Correct. Okay. Now, you were planning at that time when you talked to Eric, of course, to go to college, were you not? That's correct. And so was Eric. That's right. And what colleges were, uh, was Eric talking about going to back when you were still students in Calabasas? Back east, Princeton, or uh, one of the Ivy Leagues. And was there, in fact, um, a friend of Eric's who graduated the same year you did, who wound up going to an Ivy League school back east. A fellow named Pierce, Andy Pierce. Is Brown Ivy League? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, so that's true, there was such a friend? Yes. And didn't Eric talk about his wanting to go to Brown as well? I don't recall. He just said he wanted to go Ivy League. I take it, Mrs. Signorelli, in your conversations about your future and the, these shared conversations with Eric, uh, there was no discussion of not going to college. There was a discussion of college and then career, correct? That's correct. Well, college, but career would go on during college, okay. at least plans and connections. Like doing creative things with your friends on the side. That's correct. You graduated uh, from Calabasas High School in June of 1988. That's right. And you started school at UC Santa Barbara in September of 1988. That's correct. And Eric, meanwhile, moved from a rented house in Calabasas to the house in Beverly Hills 
in the fall of 1988? I believe so, yes. Okay. Were you in town when the family actually moved or had you already gone up to school? I think I'd already gone to school. And do you recall how long after Eric moved to Beverly Hills that you first set eyes on the Beverly Hills house? No. No. So you have no idea whether it was days, weeks, months, or years? It was probably months. And do you recall just without telling us for the moment, but do you recall the very first time you ever saw the Beverly Hills house after Eric had moved, moved there? Do you remember what time of day it was, who you were with? No, not the first time, no. Can you, in your mind, picture the first time you went there? No. You uh, told Mr. Kuriyama that you saw Eric at the Beverly Hills house a couple of times. That's correct. Is that before his parents were killed or after? Um, I think I saw him before and after. A couple of times before or, or one time before and one time after? Um, I don't know to be exact. I think a couple of times before, I believe, but I'm not sure. Not sure. Do you ever remember before his parents died being inside the Beverly Hills house? I think I walked into the, um, just into the entryway once, that was about it. I don't remember walking around the house. And on that one occasion when you think you just walked into the entryway, uh, did you see Eric? Was, did he the person who let you in? I don't know if he's who let me in. I remember seeing him, yeah, he came to the entryway. Okay, did you see well, were you by yourself or was there someone? No, right? I was with Steve Aimbotter. And Eric came to the entryway. Did he leave with the two of you or did you stay there? I mean, Yeah, we got in his father's car. All three of us. Okay. Now, apart from, that's something that happened at night, is that right? That's correct. Okay, apart from that time, do you recall any other time that you were at Eric's house in Beverly Hills before his parents were killed? Not that I recall. I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, we were best friends. We saw each other you know, all over the place. I don't remember being exactly down there. Well, you saw a good deal more of each other when Eric was still living in Calabasas and you were going to high school together sure. than after you graduated, sure. correct? And in fact, you told the police <clears throat> on August 24th, 1989, in their first interview with you, that you hadn't seen Eric for six months before uh, his parents were killed. That's, that's about right. And meanwhile, during those six months, in fact, during that entire school year, Eric was going to Beverly Hills High School. That's correct. And in your talking to him, you learned, did you not, that he had made new friends? That's correct. Now, you've testified that, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, Eric told you about a drama class that he took at Beverly Hills High School. That's right. Did he tell you that it, drama is a required course at Beverly Hills High School? No. And do you know when it was that he told you about being in a drama class? I think it was while we were down there, or while I went down there after the murders. Okay, after his parents were killed parents during were that gone. discussion? I believe so. I mean, it might have been after that even. It was during that weekend, probably. I'm sorry. It was during that weekend, probably. So would it be fair to say, Mr. Signorelli, that uh, until that weekend and over the preceding six months, you really knew very little about what Eric was doing? 
No, because I'd heard from friends. But from him directly? From him directly, no. Now, um, was it also during that weekend that you think Eric told you he had won some sort of award? Yes. Did he tell you about winning one award? Oh, this was a school award, I take it. That's right. It was the drama Best Actor Award for Beverly Hills High School Drama. That's what he told you? That's what he said. Okay. Did he tell you about winning one award or more than one award from Beverly Hills High School? Just that one. Did you understand this to be a senior's award? Like, you know, the senior class gets, you know, best looking, best legs, best, best actor, most likely to succeed, that sort of thing? No, I thought it was the theatrical award for the school. Okay. Now, someone called you and you learned that Eric's parents had been killed. That's correct. And was it that same day that you tried to reach Eric? Yes. You left a message on an answering machine, but some third party called you back. That's correct. And you don't recall who that third party was who called you back? No. What is the next contact you either initiated or actually had with Eric after that? We talked, um, we talked before I went down there for the weekend. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. How'd that come about? I don't know if it was a phone or uh, it was probably a phone call. I don't remember. And you don't remember if it was from you to him or from him to you? That's right. Did you attend the memorial service for his parents in Los Angeles? No. Did you know when that was? Yes. When was it? I don't remember the exact date now. But at the time, I knew I was supposed to go, and I didn't. How many days after you heard that the parents were dead was that memorial service? I don't recall. And how many days after that memorial service was it that you went and spent the weekend with Eric? I, I don't recall. I know I spent that weekend. It was the end of August. Okay, but my question is, do you know how long after the memorial service it no. was? And do you know where Eric was after the memorial service? No. Oh, he was staying in a hotel. He was staying in a hotel after the memorial service? That's what I believe I remember hearing, yes. Well, did you hear it from Eric? No. Okay. And is it your understanding that he stayed at the hotel and then he went back to the house where you spent the weekend with uh, him? That's correct. So you didn't know anything whatsoever about his having gone to New Jersey, I take it? Not that I remember, no. And you don't have any information about how long he was gone, do you? No. And I take it that after his parents were killed, but before you spent the weekend there, you had no contact with the members of his family from New Jersey who were here in Los Angeles? That's correct. Now, I take it it is your testimony that this conversation that you had with Eric where he gave you information about the killing of his parents took place th at the end of August. I believe it was the end of August. Or, well, it was a week and a half after it all happened, about a week and a half. Okay. How do you know it was a week and a half? Just, um, how do I know? And that's when it was. That's what I remember it being. And you've always remembered it being then, is that what you're saying? No, I never knew the exact date, but I knew it was shortly after. And you've always known it was shortly after? Yes. Okay. On uh, November 17th, 1989, did you meet with Detective Zoller, gentleman at the council table, at a Baker's Square restaurant uh, near the University of California, Santa Barbara? Mm -hmm. I, I remember meeting at Baker Square. Like I said, I, I don't remember the exact date. It was okay. four years ago. But does November sound about right? It's about right, yeah. And during the course of that meeting with Detective Zoller, did you mention for the first time that Eric Menendez had talked to you about the killing of his parents? Yes, I believe so, yes. 
And do you recall telling Detective Zoller during that interview in November that Eric told you about the death of his parents during a weekend that you spent with Eric at his house? Yes. And do you further remember telling Detective Zoller that you spent that weekend with Eric at his house one month ago, October 21st and 22nd? Do you remember telling him that? Yeah. But I also remember saying that I can't be sure of the exact date that I was there. So you weren't always sure that it was a week and a half later, were you? No. So what has happened since November 17th, 1989, months after the parents were killed, and now, years after, to uh, change your impression of when the conversation with Eric occurred? I've seen some of the written reports. Of other of, witnesses? No, of my, wit of my statements to the police and to the DA, um, and that had dates that the reports were taken, so it helped my memory. Okay, but none of those, they didn't tell you, did they, the, the district attorneys who interviewed you or the police who interviewed you, they didn't tell you when that weekend was with Eric, did they? No, I told them when the weekend was and they gave me the exa exact date. Well, how they, would they know when the weekend was, Mr. Signorelli? They, they weren't there. Well, I said, uh, they. I believe it was because I said the computer expert came up and they found the date where the computer expert was at the house and I guess and they put so those two together. I see. So you're putting your story together to match when the computer person came up. Is that is that what you mean? Well, I'm not putting my story together. I mean, you can twist my words, but I'm just telling the truth. The computer expert was there when I was there. And, I mean, they, they found the and date they told for you, me. Exactly, but, that's right. But on November 17, 1989, you thought the conversation had been one month and not three months before that. Is that right? That's correct. No, it would have been two months, wouldn't it? Or two and a half. And in fact, in that first statement that you gave to Detective Zoller, you didn't mention anything at all about a computer expert being there. The first statement was August 24th, and the I hadn't seen statement. Eric yet. And I'm not talking about seeing Eric. I'm talking about November 17th, 1989. That's right. Tell me about the computer expert, Mr. Signorelli. What did he look like? I don't remember. I, I, mean, I remember that he had a pregnant wife. That was about it. Well, I could tell you there was a computer expert. Counsel, ex let's not uh, argue with the witness. Ask a question. What, how, was, it was a man? Yes, it was a man. What was his race or ethnic background? I believe he was white. And how old was he? Maybe 30-something. I don't know. I didn't ask. Well, what did he look like? I really don't remember. What about the wife? What did she look like? She had a big stomach. <laughs> what color hair did she have? I don't recall. How old was she? <clears throat> I don't recall. And you said that they stayed at the house for about two hours? That's about right, yeah. And what did the computer expert do during those two hours? He was toying with the computer, um, trying to find what Eric said was a will. And he was going through all the files. And I think I still remember this. I don't know why, but... Well, just before, if you're going to tell us something that was said, I'll just ask you another question. Did you hear the computer... Did you finish your answer describing what the computer man was doing? No. He was doing. Okay, well, you can go on describing what he was doing. All right, he was playing with the computer, and he, was, he looked into a file of uh, trees. I don't know, and supposedly trees was a word that Eric said um, might have correlated to the will. And he was, he was searching all the files. Was he finding any files? He was finding files, but he wasn't finding what he was looking for. Not that I remember, anyway. And did you overhear the computer expert telling Eric anything about the disk being wiped or erased? I don't recall. Was there a time when Eric was in the room alone with the computer expert? 
Not that I remember. So you were always with him? I believe so, yeah. And you don't remember the expert ever saying anything about the disc being wiped or cleaned or anything like that? Not that I remember, no. And where was the wife while you and Eric and the computer expert were in the room for two hours? She was sitting right next to him. And she stayed there all that time? I think she might have gone to the bathroom once. But that was all? I think so, yeah. Now, Mr. Signorelli, was this occasion, this Friday, when you were at the Beverly Hills house, the first time that you had actually walked around the house? Yes. Tell me how you came to be at the house that day. What do you mean? How I came to be there? How did you get there? What time did you get there? Where were you coming from? <laughs> I, I don't remember. I mean, it was four years ago. I don't. I, I'm sure I drove down there. And do you? Re you said that there was a f telephone conversation, you believe, between yourself and Eric before you spent that weekend. What day was that telephone conversation? I said it might have been a telephone call. Um, I don't know. Well, something had to get you there, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Okay. How did you know he was there? <laughs> I, like I said, I mean, I guess we talked on the phone. I really, I don't remember, but I remember that, you know, he and I were going to meet up. I was going to meet him at the Beverly Hills house. And do you remember how many days before you met him, you knew you were going to meet him? No. Do you recall what time of day you went there? Mm, it was during daylight, probably. Probably late, late morning, early afternoon. Between 11 and 1, is that late morning to early afternoon? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. Are you just guessing? I'm guessing. Could it have been late afternoon? I don't believe so. No, it couldn't have been late afternoon. And you believe you drove there from your home in the valley? That's correct. And when you got there to the house, do you remember getting to the house? <laughs> no. Do you remember getting into the house? Yes. And how'd you get in? We went in through the front door because the security guard was standing outside, I remember. All right, there was a security guard standing outside the door when you got to the house. That's right. And uh, did you have any contact with that person? Yeah, I think just hello or, you know. And he let you in? Yeah. Eric said who I was. Well, how did Eric get there? <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't with him. I mean, I remember he and I walked in the front door, and he, Eric looked at the security guard and said, it's okay, and I'm like, hey, and that, that was it. Okay, well, was Eric outside when you got to the house? I believe so, yes. Waiting for you? I don't know if he was waiting or talking to the security guard. or. So he was outside, you pull up, and he goes into the house with you? That's right. Okay. And was the computer person already there? No. So how much later does the computer person show up? I don't know exactly. Minutes? Hours? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe which? Maybe minutes or hours. So you I, have I no idea. I really don't know. And what did you do then before the computer person got there? Just talked, went around the house. He showed you the house? Mm-hmm. Is that yes? Yes. And when he was taking you around the house, showing it to you, did he also show you the family room? Yes. Did he tell you at that time, this is where my parents were killed? Yes. Did he tell you at that time what the scene looked like when he came back and saw his parents after they were dead? I believe so, yes. And that's when he described some grisly details about how horrible the room looked? Um, no, not, 
I mean, he said there was skin and blood all over the place. You don't consider that grizzly? <laughs> I consider it grizzly, okay. but I, I just want to clarify that that's not when he told me exactly what happened. No, no, this is when okay. he's just describing what that room looked like. Right, right. When he saw the bodies in the room after right. they were dead. That's correct. And that's when he describes that there was this body parts and things like that's that. That's correct. Okay. Now that is not the same occasion on which he led you to believe that he and his brother had done it. That's correct. It's now your belief that that occasion happened the next day? No, no. I'm saying that happened in the evening. The evening of the same day, Friday yes, that's, evening. That's correct. And I believe you described on direct examination that when Eric was telling you the conversation in the evening, mm -hmm. he was in a conversational tone of voice, a low voice? That's correct. And was that also true when he was describing what the family room looked like with the bodies in it? Yeah, pretty much. Just ordinary chatter. Well, the, when he did the second one, it was a little lower tone. And uh, when talking about the first conversation, he's showing you the house and he shows you this room where his parents were killed. Uh, did it bother you to be in that room? A little bit, yes. Well, it bothered me to be in the house a little bit. But with all the security guards around, it was okay. It bothered you because you were afraid? Not afraid, just uncomfortable. Well, had you suggested to Eric that perhaps you should stay somewhere else? I don't believe so, no. And uh, you say you stayed at the house that night. Where did you sleep? In one of the guest bedrooms. Upstairs on the second floor? That's correct. And Eric's bedroom was up on the second floor also? That's correct. In fact, all the bedrooms but the maid's room is on the second floor. <laughs> if you remember. That's correct. <laughs> was there a time, Mr. Signorelli, um, in August, September of 1989, when you knew that Eric was staying at the home of Casey Whalen and his family? Yes. And when was that in relation to this weekend that you spent? I don't recall if it was before or after. Like I said, I'm, I'm not sure of dates. So it could have been before this weekend? Could have been. I don't know. Can I inquire who was it who had that beeper just go off? All right, from now on, when you're in this courtroom, you turn that thing off before you walk in the door, OK? Thank you. I'm sorry, you said you don't know if it was before or after that he stayed at Casey's? That's correct. Did you see him while he was at Casey's? Yes. Go by there? Yes. Well, l let me see if I can understand this. Isn't it true, Mr. Signorelli, that the time you went to Beverly Hills and Eric showed you the house and the computer guy came, that was the first time you saw him after his parents were killed? I believe so. Isn't that what you're telling us? Uh, no, I told you earlier that I'm not sure if it was a phone conversation or um, we talked about when we were going to meet, so I don't know. That's not what I'm asking. I'm talking about seeing him face to face, person to person. Do you believe that this weekend at Beverly Hills is the first time that you saw him face to face, or do you believe you saw him at Casey's before that? I don't know if I saw him at Casey's before. Um, I, I do believe that that was the first time at, at his house. That was the first time I saw him face to face. Okay, so you think that the trip to his house was the first time you saw him face to face? I believe so, yes. Therefore, if you saw him at Casey's, that would have had to have been after this. That's correct. You said that Eric was explaining to you that this computer person was looking for a will in the computer that would basically partially disinherit him. Is that right? That's correct. And did he make this statement at the same time that the computer person was there, or did he explain all this to you after the computer person had left? 
I think you did it while we were there. And since you were in the same room with the computer person, was it within earshot of the computer person? It was within, within earshot, but we were just kind of, um, the computer person and his wife were sitting there facing the computer, and we were behind him, and you know we were just kind of talking behind his back anyway. Okay. But you don't remember him talking to Eric about what he was looking for, or what he had found. What, what do you mean? Oh, strike that. Maybe it wasn't clear. When you, when you and Eric were talking about the, this will that Eric wanted to find, um, you, you don't know if you were talking loud enough for the computer person to hear. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, and you don't recall the computer person rec reporting to Eric what he had found or not found on the computer. He was saying, I'm not finding anything. He says, I'm not finding anything. Right. Is that right? Now, I mean, I can't quote that exactly. I remember, you know. Something to that effect. Right. Now, do you remember Eric talking on the telephone to anyone about what the computer expert was doing while the computer expert was still there? No. Do you know who Carlos Menendez is? I haven't met him, but I, Eric said he's his uncle. Okay. Do you recall, Eric, while you're there and the computer expert is there, uh, having a telephone conversation in which Eric is upset? No. To the best of your recollection, are you saying there was no phone conversation by Eric during the time the computer person was there? To the best of my recollection, I don't recall a phone conversation. Okay. I'm not going to say there wasn't one. But you don't remember one. That's correct. Now, it's your testimony that after the expert left, you hung out at the house, right? That Friday night? That's right. And from what the prosecution has told you about the computer expert, you now believe that that Friday night was September 1st. Is that correct? That's correct. And during that evening of that Friday night, uh, did Eric talk to you about what he had been doing the previous week and a half? Not that I remember. Like I said, I don't remember what was said after um, we talked about the killing of his parents. I'm not talking about after. I'm talking even about before. No. Well, what time was it that night when Eric talked to you about the killing of his parents? Well, strike that. What uh, time was it earlier that day when he talked to you about finding his parents in the family room? I don't recall. Was it before the computer expert came? I believe so, yes. When he was first showing you through the house? I believe so. Now, this other conversation happens Friday night. That's right. And you stayed at the house all evening? You didn't go out for a pizza or to the movies or to... No, dinner, dinner was brought in. Who brought it in? I think her name was Jade, or J.D. Uh, a friend of Eric's? That's right. And was it before dinner or after dinner that you had this conversation about killing the parents? I think it was after. Now, what had brought you and Eric to the area of the foyer in front of the doors to the family room? the place at which you say he began this conversation? I don't know. We were, were walking around the house and the bottom floor, like I said, I mean, we played chess in the, in the living room. Um, and we, we were pretty much all over downstairs. And why were you there that weekend, Mr. Signorelli? Just try to help him out. I mean, his parents had just died, and I was going as a best friend so to make sure there, everything was okay. You went there to console him? Mm -hmm. Did he need consoling? I don't know. I mean, he, was, he seemed a little down, but 
pretty normal. Seemed down but normal. Was down normal for him? No, I said a little bit down, but uh, you know, people have their bad moods, or you know, sometimes you're not up and outgoing, and like yeah. for me, this would be down right now. We weren't talking about you, though. We were talking about Eric. I understand that, but I'm trying down. to give you an example of of how personalities are. Mm -hmm. So. You felt you were doing him some good by being there with him that weekend? That's correct. Was Lyle there? No. Did you know if Lyle was even in Los Angeles? No, I don't know. Now, if I understand what you're saying, Eric tells you that he comes home from being out someplace. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And, and he, he's out someplace with his brother. That's correct. And he comes home uh, because he wants to get some ID, overage ID, so he can go to bars. That's correct. And he goes inside the house to get the ID. Mm-hmm. He then goes outside, mm -hmm. where he is greeted by his brother, who is holding two guns. That's right. And his brother says to him, let's do it. That's right. And he then proceeds to, I take it, take one of these guns and go yes. into the family room and kill his parents. That's correct. Is that a story that made sense to you when you heard it, Mr. Signorelli? What do you mean made sense? I does it make sense to you that someone would say, let's do it, and on the strength of that, someone else would kill his parents? Are you asking now, does it make sense, no, or then, did then? Then, did it make sense to you? I wasn't sure if I believed it. Now, you didn't ask Eric, why did you do it, did That's you? That's right, no. I know, everybody comments about that. <laughs> I'd move to strike that, Your Honor. There was no question. All right, the last remark is stricken, and the jury's admonished to disregard it. Let me just ask you this. Did you ask Eric why? No. Did you, in fact, ask him any questions to follow up on this story he had just told you? No. You first told this story to Detective Zoller during that November 17th meeting at Baker Square, correct? Uh, if it was November 17th, yes. Okay, why don't we just assume, unless they object, we'll okay. Thanks. Thanks. And when you told him then um, what Eric had said to you, you told Detective Zoller that uh, Eric said um, that he actually was, did not shoot his mother when he walked into the room, that although his brother said, shoot mom, he couldn't do it. That's right. But no, he did not say he didn't shoot. Well, let's, just, let's just take it one line at a time. Okay? No, I was, <laughs> okay. You said he didn't shoot, though. You told the officers on November 17th that what Eric told you was, Lyle was to shoot my dad and I was supposed to shoot my mother. You That's correct. So far? We went into the room and Lyle pointed his gun at my dad and shot him. He then went over and shot him in the head. That's Is correct. That right? I was unable to shoot my mom and she tried to get away. That's correct. Okay. Lyle shot her too. That's correct. After it looked like my mother was dead, I shot her twice with my gun. That's correct. Okay. Now, is that still what you're telling us was Eric's statement, or has that changed? I would still say that is the statement, but I'm going, I'm saying today only the parts which I remember for sure. I don't want to base what I'm saying now on those reports. I'm saying what I recall today, um, well, and that's why I left out certain pieces of that, like shooting him in the head. I don't remember today if he said that. 
and okay. I don't remember today if Eric shot first his mother or Lyle shot his mother first. Well, but what you testified to today was that Eric shot his mother while she was standing up and screaming, and that's not in this at all, is it? Counsel, let's not argue with a witness and ask a question. Isn't that what you testified to today? That's correct. Do you remember that today? Eric shot his mother while she was standing up and screaming. Yes. But uh, are you saying you didn't remember that on November 17th, 1989? No, I'm, t I'm telling you exactly what I remember today. Okay. But that's not exactly what you remember. Are you, do you, strike that, I'm sorry. Did you remember that on November 17th, 1989 when you gave your first statement to the police? I, I don't know. You do know, however, that you did not tell that to the police on that day? If it's not in that report, uh, no. If it's not I in that report, you I didn't did, tell it? I didn't tell it. Okay. Now, you also did tell them, though, on November 17th, that after Eric had told you this story about Lyle and the guns and the let's do it, and that Eric said it could happen. That's correct. And it, actually, what I said was it could have happened. Eric said it, it could, could have, have happened. happened. Yes. Could have happened. Yes. That's what I told the police. Okay. And I, now, now just <laughs> there's no question pending, Mr. Signorelli. We'll give you one. Now. When you heard this story from Eric, you said you did, weren't sure that you believed it. That's true. And isn't that part of the reason why you never asked any questions? That's true. And that's part of the reason. And didn't you say to Eric, in fact, when he was telling you this story, I don't believe you. You've got too big a heart. No. Never said that. I don't believe so, no. So you never told him you didn't believe him? I don't think I said the, those words, no. Well, what words did you say? I, I don't believe I ever said I don't believe you or, or you're lying or anything like that, no. No, I'm not saying you said he was lying, but did you tell him you thought he was putting you on, pulling your leg, spinning a fantasy, I playing think, mind games? I don't think so, no. Now, didn't you guys play mind games with each other all the time? Yes. It was an aspect of your friendship, wasn't it? That's why I said it could have happened to the police. Because, because I wasn't sure at the time if what he was telling me the truth, and I did not want to be the one to turn him in. So you didn't know if he was playing a mind game or not? That's correct. And in fact, you did not go to the police with this story. They came back to you on November 17th. That's correct. And on November 17th, you told them Eric had told you this story, but you also told them these words, it could have happened, to let them know that maybe it was a mind game. Is that a fair statement of why you said that? Not to let them know, because I... I was worried. I asked them in that same conversation, no, just, I believe, just, about... You could just answer uh, yeah. the question. No, Your Honor, I'm... Okay, counsel, let's not argue. Uh, the objection is that this is non-responsive, so ask a question okay. and we'll get a, an answer. All right. Now, it's your testimony, is it not, that you told the police that Eric said it could have happened, but Eric didn't really say that to you? That's correct. Okay. And you told that to the police that Eric had conditioned this story to you on November 17th. I guess, okay. That Since November. They didn't object, yes. At the Baker Square. And it wasn't until March 7th of 1990 that you explained to the authorities that Eric hadn't said it could have happened. That's correct. When you spoke to the police at Baker Square, was it during that meeting that they asked you to wear a body wire 
and have a meeting with Eric that they could record? I don't believe so. Well, how long after that interview with the police at Baker Square did the issue of your wearing a body wire for a meeting with Eric come up? Sometime within the next week and a half. Now, Mr. Signorelli, when the police first came to talk to you about this situation, it was August 24th, 1989. That's correct. And at that time, were you told that you were a suspect? Yes. And did you believe that, that you were a suspect? <laughs> sure. They said everyone was sus everybody was a suspect. Okay. And they were at your house. That's that correct. Right? You had come home and seen a police car outside your house. Mm-hmm. And you had driven around for a few minutes before that's, going in? That's correct. And you immediately assumed the police car may have had something to do with your friend Eric's dead parents? That's right. And you went in the house, and sure enough, there were Beverly Hills police officers wanting to talk to you about Eric Menendez? That's correct. And uh, did they bring crime scene photographs with them to your house that night? Not that I remember. Do you remember any occasion when the Beverly Hills Police brought crime scene photographs to your house? I think so, yeah. And did those crime scene photographs include photographs of Mr. and Mrs. Menendez? I didn't see them. Well, do you know if they were in the photographs? Were you told they were? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. Was someone trying to show them to you? Did you refuse? Is that why you didn't see them? No. They asked me if I wanted to see them. Who's they? I believe it was the time when they came over with a search warrant, and it was detectives. And I think there were some police with them. Was it detectives? Was it Zoller and mm -hmm. Linehan? Mm-hmm. Yes. 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 So um, we'll get to the search warrant, but there was a time that Zoller and Linehan came with a search warrant and with crime scene photographs. I don't know if they had the crime scene photographs, but someone there did. Well, did someone being some police person? Yes, I guess so. I, I don't know which one of them it was. Well, were you told why it was they wanted you to look at the crime scene photographs? They didn't say they wanted me to look at it. They asked if I would like to see them. Did, was there any reason that they gave as to why they were offering to show you crime scene photographs? Rephrase the question. Were you told why they were offering you to be, to be shown the crime scene photographs? They wanted me to realize how serious it was. Had you done something unserious about the situation, Mr. Signorelli? Um, what do you mean? Well, you said they wanted you to realize how serious the situation was. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Were they yes. angry with you in January? Did you get that impression the police were angry? Sustained. Did they act as if they were angry? Uh, Detective Zoller did, yes. Did he accuse you of anything? Not that I remember, no. Did he tell you in January that you were still a suspect? No, I don't think so. Did they tell you in November when they asked you to wear the body wire that you were still a suspect? Not that I remember, no. And what was their reason that they, it, well, did they give you a reason why they wanted you to wear a body wire? Yes. What was the reason? They asked me to, um, talk to Eric about what happened that night. But they and wanted they you to wear a body wire and go to a meeting with Eric and see if you could get him to talk about killing his parents. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yes. So they wanted you to act as an agent for the police, right? I guess that's what you call it. I don't know. But you knew you, they were asking you to help them get Eric. Right? No, they were asking me to wear a wire, and if things were said at that conversation, which would help them, yes. Okay, it would help them, it would help them arrest Eric. Yes. And you were willing to help the police to get your best friend arrested. 
correct? That's correct. And is it your testimony that they did not also tell you at that time that if you did not help them, they would wait, consider wait. you a suspect? I'm sorry, there are a couple of negatives in there. Could you repeat that? Right. <coughs> Raise the question, please. Did they tell you in that same conversation that if you did not help them, then they would go on considering you a suspect? Not that I remember, no. Did they tell you that if you did not help them, anything bad would happen to you? Not that I remember, no. Okay, so there was no downside. <laughs> no. The downside was I was uh, doing this no to my best friend. Pen. There's no question pending. All right, have you finished the answer? That was finished. Okay, that answer will stand. I didn't hear it, Jerome, but I will right, have it we'll back. We'll have the core report to read it back. Well, I can hear it later. I will have the core report to read it back so you can hear it. The downside was I was doing this to my best friend. Mm. Well, that was the downside for your best friend, wasn't it? <laughs> for myself also. So you go to dinner with Eric wearing this body wire, right? Yes. And you bring up the murder of his parents, right? I don't recall. I believe so, yes. And he tells you he didn't kill his parents, right? No, he said I shouldn't have said that. Well, he says, uh, you know that we didn't kill our parents. You don't remember him saying that to you? If, yeah, I think I do remember that. I do remember that. Yeah. And Are you now going into this uh, conversation at the restaurant? Oh, I was going to go into, no, just his last words on that tape, Your Honor. All right. Unless you want to wait and have a... Well, I, my thought was if you're going to go into extensive examination regarding that conversation, we'll take our recess at this point. Well, I still have a lot more examination. This one is. We'll take our All right, we'll take a recess then until 1.30, ladies and gentlemen. Don't discuss this case with anyone. Don't form any opinions about it. And we'll resume at 1.30. And everyone is present. We'll resume with the trial. Jury's in a jury box. You can take the witness down again, please. And Mr. Signorelli, I'll remind you, you're still under oath. All right, you may resume your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Signorelli, between September the 1st, the Friday that you say you slept over at uh, Eric's house, and November 29th, which is the dinner at Gladstone's, how many times did you see Eric? I don't know if the meeting at Casey Whalen's house was during that period, then at least once. Apart from seeing him at Casey Whalen's house, did you see him on any other occasion between those two dates? Not that I can remember. Now, we've established that you gave an interview at Baker Square Restaurant to the police, um, and I believe the date is November 17th. That's correct. Right? And I think you've told us that you did not arrange at that meeting with the police to wear a body wire in order to have a meeting with Eric. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, is it your testimony that you don't recall when, between November 17th, that meeting with the police, and November 29th, the night of the dinner, you had contact with the police to set up this body wire dinner? It was sometime during that week and a half. Okay. Now, sometime before you actually walked into the restaurant to, to meet Eric, you met with the police on November 29th. That's correct. And they had to outfit you with this recording device that we've referred to as a body wire. That's correct. And where did you meet with them? At the Beverly Hills Police Station. And did, did you go to the Beverly Hills Police Station from your home? I believe so, yes. So you drove from the West Valley to Beverly Hills for them to outfit you? I believe so, yeah. What I, time was it that you went to the police station? I don't know, evening. 
No, I'm sorry. They did not outfit me at the police station. Mm -hmm. but did you I didn't go to say the they outfitted me there. I said I went to the police station. We discussed being outfitted with the wire. Okay. And was there some discussion, without telling us what it is just yet, was there some discussion about how you were to behave and what you were to talk about during this dinner with Eric? Not really, no. And then did you then proceed to Gladstone's restaurant? Yes. From the police station? No. Okay, where'd you go first? Uh, up a hill about a mile and a half away from the restaurant. And uh, what was done up the hill? Uh, am I allowed to tell this? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is police procedure. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell. <laughs> Well, just Pardon? tell us what you did. The question, sir. Um, I had a wire uh, put under my shirt and under my arm, and I was given a calculator with a wire in it. A calculator with a wire in That's it? Correct. What was that for? That was to place on the table as another one, another so, microphone. So there were two microphones, two separate uh, listening devices. That's correct. And was it your understanding that the police would be listening? Uh, as the conversation was going on. Yes. And did you get to the restaurant before Eric or after? I believe before. And were you seated at a table when he arrived? No. So you met up with him? Outside in the parking lot and then walked in. And after you were led inside, you were taken to a table and you sat down? That's correct. And then you put the calculator with the wire in it between the two of you? On the table, just to my right side between the two of us, yes. And we'll get back to that in one minute. I want to change the subject for a moment. Uh, the police came to your house with a search warrant. Uh, do you remember when that was? No, I don't remember the date. Was it in January of 1990? Approximately, yes. And was that search warrant for some school notebooks? Yes. Now, on November 17th, 1989, had you told the police that you had written down what Eric had said to you at his house in a school notebook? No, what I said was I had begun to worry about it, and I had started writing some things down about well, what he told me. Let me just uh, read this to you. Did you tell the police that you began to worry about having this knowledge and wrote down the information in a school book? That's correct. And by the information, didn't you mean the statement that Eric had given you about killing his parents? That's what I had intended to do when I told the police I had started writing these things down. Well, I just read your and book. That, that's right, but I hadn't finished writing everything. I, I had started writing it, and I, I don't want to give the impression that I would completed writing everything. I was keeping kind of a, a journalistic recollection of what was said. Okay, well, did you write down anything of what Eric said he did with respect to killing his parents? No. So when you told the police that you had written down that information, that wasn't true, was it? No, what was true was that I was writing down the information. Well. Not that I had written it down. I was in the process of That you were going to write it down. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And on the strength of your telling Detective Zoller that you were going to write this information down, he issued a search warrant for school notebooks. Is that what you're saying? I don't know if that's why, but well, that's what he the did have a search for. warrant. That's correct. And before he issued that search warrant for school notebooks, had he asked you to produce them? I don't recall. Now, they served that warrant on your home on January 25th, 1990. And did you turn over to them school notebooks? Yes. And did either of those school notebooks that you turned over contain one word of what Eric supposedly told you about killing his parents? I don't believe so, no. Were you angry with or upset with the Beverly Hills Police Department for serving that search warrant on your home? Not for serving the search warrant, no. But you were angry or upset with them for some other reason? That's correct.
You were not, however, angry and upset with the Beverly Hills Police Department on the evening of November 29th when you did this body wire thing with Eric. Is that right? That's correct. How long were you and Eric at the dinner table that night? Probably a couple hours. And I'm correct in stating, am I not, Mr. Signorelli, that you did not get what you wanted for the police in that conversation. You did not get a confession from Eric. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's correct. And after the dinner, you and Eric walked outside together? That's right. And he left first? I believe his car was brought first. I don't remember. I mean, it was valeted. And after he, you and he were separated, you said something to the police over the body wire, didn't you? I believe so, yes. You said, well, guys, I guess that didn't help much, huh? That's correct. I have nothing further. Redirect examination. Signorelli, you said that at first when Eric told you that he, had, he and his brother had uh, shot their parents, that you did not believe him. Is that correct? That's right. I wasn't sure if I believed him. What was your reaction? I get asked that almost every day. Your Honor, I'm going to object to these gratuitous remarks that Mr. Velasquez has stricken. And that is not the Objection is overruled, but try not to volunteer things. All right, the answer will stand. Re ask the question, please. What was your reaction when Eric Menendez took you into that uh, room and explained to you how he and his brother had killed their parents? Um, just accept it. Um, I, I wasn't going to make a big issue out of it because, I mean, if you picture yourself in that situation, you don't, oh my God, or you don't, you know, run out of the room. It just, this was my best friend, and he had told me what happened, and I don't know. I, we just kind of kept going on with the conversation and okay, you know, and we didn't really touch on it again after that. Now, you were asked the question of whether or not you went to the police with this information initially, correct? That's correct. And do you recall on November 17th, 1989, that the police came to see you for a second time? That's right. And do you recall what you told them on that date? Well, Your Honor, I... What? You need more specific as to okay. what it is that you're asking. <laughs> Did you, do you remember uh, being reluctant initially to say anything to the police? Objection. Yes. Objection. Objection overruled. I was going to object based on being. Objection overruled. Yeah, Moral? yes, I was, I was <laughs> worried. Um, I had asked about the witness protection program Objection at the time. Objection may we approach? You may. All right, uh, cross examinators or redirect examination may be uh, continue at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Signorelli, you indicated that uh, you first got the information from Eric Menendez on about uh, September 1st of 1989. And when the police came to see you on November 17th, 1989, what was your state of mind at that time? Um, I was <laughs> extremely nervous. That was at the interview at Baker Square, correct? Yes. Um, I was nervous and I had asked about the witness protection program and I told them that I had some information for them and uh, they said it would be kept confidential and I just I told them what I knew and that was that was about it. I was just worried. What were you worried about? I was telling them that my best friend killed his parents, or told me that he killed his parents, and um, <laughs> just it was a hard thing to do. In fact, you didn't initially go to the police with this information. No. The police came to you. That's correct. Now, after this uh, November 17, 1989 interview that you had with the um, Beverly Hills detectives, you were cooperating in the investigation. Would that be fair to say? That's correct. 
and that you actually wore a body wire on uh, November 29th, 1989, correct? That's correct. Now, you were asked on cross-examination regarding some incident in which uh, the Beverly Hills Police Department was a bit upset with you. Can you explain that? Well, I would object to explaining it if we have no proposal. We have a little more clarification as to what exactly you're referring to. Yes, you indicated that uh, there was one occasion where the Beverly Hills Police Department uh, detectives came to your house, correct? That's correct. And on cross-examination, you said that uh, Detective Zoller was um, a bit angry with you. Was That's that correct. Fair to say. Why was that? Your Honor, again, I'm going to object. This is like an offer of proof as to whether it's based on hearsay, speculation. Objection sustained. Uh, you can ask a more direct question. Okay. What did you do? Did you do anything in, in uh, that caused the detectives to perhaps be upset? Yes. What What did you do? I, uh, <laughs> I sent a fax uh, to the police uh, stating that, that they had... I'm going to object at this point to the fax. I want to ask to be heard. All right, you may approach again. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, when we have these conferences at the bench, don't be concerned about what we're talking about. That's exactly what the lawyers uh, want to do. They want to talk. And my job is to listen, and then after... I listen and I do some talking, but when that happens, don't be concerned about what we're saying. It's just part of the process of a trial, and uh, you shouldn't be concerned about the nature of our conversations. All right, you may resume. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Signorelli, did uh, the problem with the police department ha any, have anything to do with your mother? Yes. Would you explain that to the jury? Uh, sure. Um, the, I, when I had first gotten involved in this investigation, uh, I had specifically requested that my family not be informed about me being involved. I did not want them to know I was part of this investigation or part of any help with the prosecution. And I wanted to protect at least my mother and my brother and keep them completely detached. Just <laughs> do not want them involved, and to this day I still don't. Um, and the day after I had said that, oh, also, um, I didn't want her to know that I was taking time off of school because she'd get upset that this is affecting me. Um, the day after the police, or my mom came up to me and said, why are you taking time off school and why are you involved in this investigation? And, um, at that point I became extremely irritated with the police uh, because I knew they had just stabbed me in the back. They had, they had told your mother that you were assisting in the investigation? That's correct. And did you express your dismay with uh, Detective Zoller? Yes. And di did uh, Detective Zoller then respond uh, at how serious this case was? Not at that time. At another time, time yes. Later? Yes. So that's your reference on cross-examination to this problem with the police? That's correct. When you told the police on November 17, 1989, that uh, it could happen, it could have happened, what, what is it that you meant by that? That is, after you explained to the police that Eric Menendez had told you that he and his brother had killed their parents, you added a phrase, it could have happened. Well, like I said, I, I really wasn't sure what to think at that point, and I didn't want to be the one to actually turn in my best friend. Um, so I kind of put that little stipulation on, hoping that, you know, maybe that wouldn't be the turning point in the whole thing. And, uh, I mean, he never actually said it. I said it, and obviously I shouldn't have. But uh, I just had real big hesitations about being the person to do it, to turn him in. Drawing your attention to November 29th of 1989 in this uh, tape conversation at Gladstone's. Did Eric Menendez ever make any statements referring to what he had told you before, that is, referring to his statement that he and his brother had killed their parents? Yes. What did he say about that during that November 29th conversation? That he shouldn't have joked around about it. Um, and that I shouldn't, or I should know he was kidding. So he 
attempted to tell you that he was joking about his explanation of killing his parents? Correct. Did he then tell you uh, to do something with respect to your information as it related to the police investigation? He said I shouldn't tell them. Tell them what? Tell the police what he had told me. And he told you that on tape? I believe so, yes. Did uh, Eric Menendez ever tell you that other people in particular were involved in the killing of his parents in this November 29th conversation? Well, that was asked and answered on direct. Let me well, answer. What do you mean? Did, did, did he ever mention other people that may have been involved in the killing of his parents? Yeah, he said uh, that there, he thought it was mob related and that um, somebody from the company may have done it. And, um, I don't remember what else. Did he ever mention any uh, foreign hitmen? Well, I'm going to object to leading. This question was asked and answered on direct. All right, I'll permit it to overrule. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, he did. He said from Cuba. Mr. Signorelli, I'm going to draw your attention to the uh, the date of the computer expert being at Mr. Menendez's house and being the date that you uh, took the statement or heard the statement from Eric Menendez? Are you good with dates? No. <laughs> now, do you recall talking to me about a month ago about this case? Yes. Do you recall me asking you? Objection here, sir. This offer for the truth of uh, what was said? No, it's just a question that I was asked, so it's not actually a statement. You, it's a question that you asked? The yes. Objection over. Thank you. Do you recall me asking you if you had any better idea of when it was that uh, Eric Menendez made these statements to you? Yes. And what did you tell me? I said it was the day that the computer guy came to the house. Did you further explain that the computer guy had somebody with him? Yes, I said he had a wife who was pregnant with him. And was Detective Zoller with me at the time? Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, Detective Zoller was with us. Did Detective Zoller ascertain when it was that the uh, computer man with the pregnant wife was there at that location? Yes. And is that how you arrived at the particular date? Yes. Now, you had indicated that the, the uh, defendant uh, was your best friend during the time that you had with him in Calabasas, correct? That's correct. Now, you were asked on cross-examination whether uh, Eric, defendant Eric Menendez was the number one singles player for the school. That's correct. Was he for a time? For a time, yes. What would, how would you describe, describe him as an athlete? He's a great athlete. I mean, we, um, he was training for a triathlon that he and I were going to run. Um, just, just, just big, strong kid. He was no wallflower, was he? No. I would object to that, Your Honor. Overruled. What was your answer? No. Now, the, the uh, tournaments that you went to, uh, competitions around Southern California? That's correct. You would compete in those as well? Yes. And you would see uh, defendant Eric Menendez there? Yes. Would he be with his parents on occasion? Once in a while. Would he be um, by himself on other occasions? Yes. Would you, would you always be with your parents? No. Were there some uh, tournaments that were, were local, I mean close to home? Yes. Okay. With respect to the uh, first time that you had spoken to the detectives, November 17th, 1989, when you told them the information that Eric Menendez had told you, did you tell the detectives at that point that you were having a, a hard time with the information that you had? Yes, I said it was bothering me and worrying me. I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. <laughs>
I take it, Mr. Signorelli, that you're no wallflower either. Is that right? No. In fact, you like attention, do you not? Yes. You like to be the center at parties. You'd like to be the center of your group of friends. Do you like to be the center of attention at parties and among your friends? No. Yeah. Among friends, yes. Not at parties. Do you like the fact that there's a television camera on you right now? Absolutely not. Did you ask the prosecution to ask the judge if you could not be filmed? No, I asked the prosecution if it was possible to ask the judge if I could not be filmed. And they said that the day before somebody had asked that. And the judge said he will dictate which parts of the testimony are released, but it will be filmed. That's what the, who told you that? I don't remember, one of the two. One of the two lawyers, one of the so two one prosecutors? Of the, the, either Lester or Les Zoller. Either Mr. Kuriyama or Detective Zola? Yes. So you didn't ask them to ask the judge to keep you off the camera? No, I said, can I ask? In fact, you got dressed up today to be on camera, didn't you? No, I got dressed up because, I'm sorry, can I answer that? Yeah, Thank you. I got dressed up because I'm in a courtroom and this is my future. You were in this courtroom last Friday and you were wearing jeans and a white polo shirt, weren't you? That's correct, because it was supposedly, from my understanding, an informal hearing. Now, you said on November 17th you had reluctance because you didn't want to bring your friend down. Is that right? That's correct. On November 29th, though, you wore the body wire. You weren't reluctant anymore. Is that right? That's correct. Now, during that body wire conversation, just a moment. During that body wire conversation, Eric asked you, I'll strike that. During that conversation, you told Eric that reporters were coming up to Santa Barbara trying to talk to you. Is that right? That's correct. And everybody up there was talking about rumors that you were a suspect. Is that right? I don't recall that. Did you tell Eric, everybody still wonders about me up there, meaning Santa Barbara? Yeah, I believe I said that. And did Eric then ask you, what about the police? I, and when I made my statement, I don't believe I was referring to being a suspect. If you would just answer the question, did Eric, after you said, everybody still wonders about me up there, did Eric then say, what about the police? I guess so, yes. Did you get a copy, a uh, transcript of that body wire conversation? Yes, but Did it was a two-hour conversation, and I can't remember every word. I'm sorry. Okay. But, but you have read it since the prosecution gave it to you? Yes. Okay. Do you recall then, um, after Eric said, what about the police, you said, I don't know about the police? Uh, yes. And did Eric then ask you, talk to them? Pardon? Did, Did Eric then ask you? Counsel, why don't you just tell us the page? So that oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Counsel. Mr. has difficulty finding what page you're referring to. B16 of 33, Mr. Curiano. I'll wait till he gets there. Go ahead. Okay. In other words, did Eric then ask you if you've talked to the police? Yes, I believe he did ask me that. And you told him, I have talked to them. I believe so. And then he said, what'd you tell them? Remember that? Yes. And you said, I still think they think I'm a suspect. Okay. And then Eric said, Surely you would never have told them anything that I told you. That's correct. And is that what you were referring to uh, when Mr. Kuriyama asked you a little while ago, did Eric tell you not to tell the police? Uh, yes. So in fact, he didn't tell you not to tell the police. He said, 
Surely you didn't tell the police what I told you. That's correct. Now, you got angry with the homicide detectives from the Beverly Hills Police Department who were investigating this case because they told your mother that you were working with them on the case. Is that what you're saying? No. I well, got upset with them no, because... Just, just no is your answer. You had asked them not to let your mother know what you were up to. That's correct. And you discovered that they had told your mother not only were you working on the case, but you were missing classes in order to do it. That's No, I said I was leaving school. Leaving school? Yes. Well, what is, you mean leaving, like taking a leave? Like or? taking a leave of absence from the university, yes. So the officers told your mother that you were taking a leave of absence from the university? I believe so. Were you taking a leave of absence? I was intending to, yes. Okay, and that's what got you upset with them because it got your mother upset with you. That's correct. And in response to your being upset with the detectives, you sent them a fax transmission. That's correct. Your Honor, I have a document. What's the next number? I would like at some point to substitute this, uh, the original for this, but I understand Detective Zoli doesn't have it for today. All right, it'll be Exhibit 48. Mr. Signorelli, is this a copy of the fax that you sent to the Beverly Hills Police Department homicide? Yes. And uh, you basically, the message of this fax was you're chiding them and telling them they were not to be trusted, exclamation point. That's correct. And you signed this fax in the name of the fictional character that you and Eric had created. Is that right? That's correct. You quote in this fax one of the Psalms, I take it. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. And that was one of Eric's favorite sayings, yes. Yes, it's also part of the Bible. Are you aware of that? Yes. And. Uh, Betrayal signifies evil, you wrote to the Beverly Hills That's Police. correct. Does it, Mr. Signorelli? I told you I was very upset. Does betrayal signify evil? Sometimes, yes. I have nothing further. Anything else? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Mr. Signorelli, counsel just read you an excerpt out of the November 29th, 1989, conversation that you had with Eric Menendez. And it stopped after Eric said, surely you would never have told them anything that I told you. Did the conversation continue with Eric saying, like that, because I mean that's, and your response, yeah, that's what I'll tell him. Hi, Eric, Eric killed his parents in a joking tone. That's correct. Is that what you stated? Yes. And that Eric then responded, because I, I could use this, they don't know who, and then unintelligible, suspect me, they suspect my brother. Did he make those statements That's to you? That's right. So he didn't, want to, he didn't want you to tell the police that he had told you that he had killed his parents, correct? That's correct. Did Eric Menendez tell you anything about having to carry a weapon? Yes, he said he had to carry a gun. Why? Uh, he was afraid of the people that supposedly had done this thing, had killed his parents. And he told you he had to carry a gun for that reason? That's correct. And does Eric Menendez state on the November 29th interview, there's not much I can do, man. It's uh, page B13 of 33. There's not much I can do, man. 
but I carry a gun around with me. That's correct. So he was telling you that uh, he needed protection from uh, these people that killed his parents? That's correct. He had told you already that he had killed his parents along with his brother. Objection. Correct? That's correct. Objection overruled. The answer is death. And uh, nevertheless, he continued giving you this information about having to carry a gun and having uh, hitmen from Cuba come to, or th they're responsible for, your father, for his father's death? That's, just That's correct. Objection overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further. Anything further? No, Your Honor. All right. Um, thank you.